Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good to have you all here. Well, it's 937. Dan, how many do we have? Uh, looks like we are up to 33 of the 39 participants. Great. Well, to be uh, respectful of the people who did come on time, I'm going to get started. And I am Dr. Anna Bedard, and I'm just leading the first part of the meeting. And uh, I'd like to welcome you to the Office of Illinois Works 2024 Grantee Manual Webinar 2. Thank you for joining us today. The, the 2024 Grantee Manual is comprised of 14 sections that we're covering in three different webinars. So we had our first webinar last Thursday. This is the second of the three webinars. And the target audience, and hopefully who's here today in the webinar, is those individuals accountable for data entry, data management, pre apprenticeship program completion tracking, transition support, follow-up services, or any task related to maintaining contact with participants after graduating from your program. So your job title may include, but it's not necessarily, but it may include program administrator, program manager, pro program coordinator, outreach and recruitment coordinator, wraparound service coordinator, student support service coordinator, and training coordinator um and uh and so welcome all of you it's great to have you here again i'm dr anna bedard and i am a training analyst and program coach with the program i am new to illinois works but i am not new to nonprofit capacity building you if you've been in other sessions with us you've heard me say i've done a lot of work with nonprofits, uh, was co-founder of the nonprofit Center for Nonprofit Effectiveness, done a lot with management and pace work and really helping nonprofits to increase their ability to serve their clients well. And I myself worked in nonprofits for 10 to 15 years. I've lost track. Um, so I like to think I know a little bit of what you're going through. And, uh, and I'm just thrilled to be here. I've also worked in the for-profit sector, and it's great to be back in the nonprofit space. I'd like to invite our other facilitators to introduce themselves. We've got four of us on the call today who are who will be speaking at different times. And I'll ask uh, Dr. Norman Ruano just to briefly introduce yourself and then pass it on maybe to Dan from there. Hi, good morning. Uh, thanks for joining us today. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm glad you've taken the time to join us. I'm Norman Ruano and I'm the Deputy Director of the Office of Illinois Works and I'll be one of the presenters today. I'll pass it on to Dan Martinez. Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Dan Martinez. I am one of the grant managers with the Office of Illinois Works Pre Apprenticeship Program, and I'm excited to continue on your journey with the grantee manual. And Gia. And I think Gia might be having uh, issues with her audio, so I will just say Dr. Gia Sutt. Oh, here you are. Okay. Thank you, Anna, and thank you, everyone, and welcome. Um, glad to have all of you all here, and I will pass it back to Anna. Okay, thank you so much. And then I would also like to recognize, acknowledge, and thank uh, the other members of our team who are also passionate and committed to supporting your pre-apprenticeship program's success, and that includes our three grant manager analysts, so your grant managers, 
Dan Martinez, Stephen Scott, and Monica Pruitt. Uh, you want to just come off mute and say hi so they can see you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Monica. And then Steve. Good morning, everyone. I'm Steve Scott. One year Wonderful. Back. And you all met Dan already. And then I'd like to also uh, introduce Dr. Vera Lee Robinson, who is also a training analyst and program coach. So it's the three of us, me, Gia, and Vera Lee. You want to say hi, Vera Lee? Yes. Good morning, everyone, and welcome back. Thank you. And just so you know, so this program is there's there's three parts to this Illinois Works program, um, and that and that includes this the pre apprenticeship program that you're part of. There's also the apprenticeship initiative, and there's a team accountable for that. And we have a bid credit program, a program that was recently launched, and we're working on uh, building the team for that. And um, Illinois Works, just to give a little background in case you weren't on the last call, Illinois Works was created as a result of Governor Pritzker's historic $45 billion capital plan and his commitment to expanding equity in the Illinois, in the Illinois construction workforce. So as an Illinois Works pre-apprenticeship program grantee, you are now part of this exciting new initiative that will create opportunities for Illinois businesses, communities, and families. And so we've got the three parts of the program, the apprenticeship initiative, the pre-apprenticeship program, that's us, and the bid credit program. And then this training is second of a three-part series that reviews each section of the grantee manual for the pre-apprenticeship program for 2024. And we're doing it to ensure that you can effectively implement your pre-apprenticeship program. So during this webinar, we will cover the next five sections of the grantee manual. So if you have not yet accessed it, the link is being provided to you in the chat. Please notice that we will be referring to the grantee manual throughout the session, including page numbers, tables, exhibits, etc. So if you want to pull that up, you can feel free to follow along yourselves or just follow along with us. And uh, and then all of the guidance in this session is based on the 2024 Illinois Works uh, Pre-Apprenticeship Program Grantee Manual. Please note that manuals from previous grant years are no longer valid. So if you have those, please put them aside they're not going to help you here. <laughs> we want to make sure that you're working off of the right manual, and that is the 2024 manual, which you uh, have in the link. So we're going to cover today, we're going to cover section four through uh, eight. Okay, so that's the outreach and recruitment program application and intake, wrap participant wraparound services and student support services, training, instruction and certifications, and program completion transfer transition services and follow up. So let's look at the uh, next slide, the course objectives. So by the end of this training, you will be able to identify outreach and recruitment tools and methods, respond to leads based on their category apply eligibility criteria, support potential participants through the program application process, complete an intake process, provide wraparound services, and provide support services. And so then let's talk a little bit uh, more in the next slide uh, about the course overview. And I, so I talked already about how Illinois uh, works, I think, I think I'm a little, yeah, let's go great. Oh, I'm sorry, there's more course objectives. I'm toggling a bit, forgive me. Uh, so then you'll also be able to comply with the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, implement a comprehensive program orientation, create a comprehensive curriculum based on experiential training, incorporate an evaluation, and a, this is a program evaluation for your training, and, and we'll talk more about those uh, Kirkpatrick, the evaluation model, provide transition services and engage in follow up activities. So, 
uh, please know that this session is being recorded. Um, just keep that in mind. And uh, and and there's the recording will be available for review later on our Illinois Works Partner Guide website. Okay, so and then uh, Steve is putting or has put the link to the Illinois Works Partner Guide in the chat, and that is a key link. Please save it if you have not done so already, because you'll be going back there again and again to get the information that you need for the program. So, any questions before we proceed to the next? section. If if so, you can unmute your line or you can put the question in the chat. All righty. So we'll move on. Um, let's talk Mentimeter. Um, welcome and introduction. So by the end of this module, yeah, good. So I just want to get you familiar with Mentimeter. So this is a tool that we use to make this training more engaging for you. And, uh, and so we're going to start off by having you go into the site. You can do it on your phone or you can do it on your computer. If you have your computer open, we'll be coming back at different points to uh to to use this so if you can just find uh get in there www.menti.com and then you want to put that code in three four four nine six one six five i know if your phone if you're on your phone especially it takes a minute to type everything in so we will be patient <clears throat> um tina you're very welcome so I'm going to wait a minute because I was doing this early. I said, let me understand the participant experience. And I know that it takes a minute, so I'm going to be patient. Maybe, uh, well, I can't see you all. I was going to say, raise your hand if you've actually gotten in, but I think we can see who's gotten in. If we go to the next slide, then uh, we can see there. And so far, it's very small for me, but it looks like we only have a couple people in. So we're going to keep this. And, and note, we're, we're going to stay on the slide now, but if you haven't yet gotten in, the code is at the top, right? So it has the information with the code on the top so that if you, you're still working on it, that you can do that. And uh, and so the, and, and your name, or I actually did mine wrong because I did not put my location. I am in Barrington, Illinois, so I'm in the greater Chicago area. And, uh, and I think we can go back to the next slide. Yeah, I don't know if that's something that you are controlling or if Mentimeter is going back and forth, but. Uh, thank you, Gia, for bringing that up. And this is the information that you're adding, your name, your organization and agency, your role, your geographic location. And if you attended session one, add an asterisk by your name. So if you already put it in, you're like, oh, I didn't put my asterisk, don't worry about it. Um, but if you're still working on it, you want to put all of these items in. Awesome. Welcome, everyone. If you guys see, oh, you know, I don't want to butcher people's names. Uh, <laughs> I'm looking at this, especially because I can barely see it because it's so small. Let's see, Mar Maria, maybe from Petrovich, uh, from the Petrovich group. Oh, great. Welcome. Welcome. Shubra from League IT, County, Quad County Urban League. Okay, great. And I see how it kind of puts uh, things together in ways. Jamie Livingston from also from Rock Island. We've got Tina Horn from the Y. Uh, Juria from the Awaken Foundation, welcome. And don't worry about having put an asterisk next your name or not. Joe Chapa from uh, Lewis U. Uh, great. We've got, see, we have LaShonda uh, Hayes. Oh, yeah. Hi, LaShonda. <laughs> great. Uh, and Cherie Gilmore from the y YMCA. Javier Garcia from Quad, Quad County Urban League. Uh, and I guess we could go on. Maybe we can just scroll quickly. I want to welcome everyone. I see we've got data entry specialists, supportive services, program administrators, um, 
And uh, really great to have you here. We've got uh, the CEO of Chicagoland Prison Outreach. Welcome. Really great to see who we've got in the room and that we have people with a variety of roles. So thank you so much for everyone. Yeah, let's, we'll keep scrolling here. We've got uh, case managers. We've got program supervisors. You want to keep scrolling? Does that automatically scroll, Gia, or are you doing it? Um, okay, great. Um, more program supervisor. So really wonderful. So great to have all of you on. Um, and so we'll move now to the next Mentimeter here. Ah, no, we're moving to the WebEx tutorial. I'm just going to really quickly go through this for anybody who's not been on this. So you will see at the bottom of your screen, you've got a mute button. And so please, if you're not speaking, uh, if you could put yourself on mute, that would be helpful to avoid any background noise. Um, we've got this, you can turn your video on and off. Please don't hit the share button. <laughs> We're the one sharing. Um, but I want to bring your attention to the uh, the raising of hands. So if you do have a question at any time in the program, feel free to put it in the chat, but you can also feel free to raise your electronic hand. And that will then kind of comes up for us and uh, and then we can allow you to speak at any time. And then there's also, we've got little emojis and those are fun. If anybody's ever been on Zoom, it actually works really similar to Zoom. And then I just wanna make sure that everybody can find your chat. And so the chat is all the way on the right-hand side, way on the right. And you have that little icon. If, you're, if your screen is big enough, it also says chat. So I'd like you to uh, just bring that up in case you need it. That way you're not having to hunt for it in the moment. And, uh, and that way, if other people are asking questions that might be of interest to you, that you, then you can see that as well. So anything about that before I move on? I wanna make sure that you all, anybody's stuck? Okay, good. So I'm gonna, we're, I'm gonna move on, but if you are having an issue with the Metameter, you can feel free to put that in the chat. We've got really the whole team is monitoring the chat. Monica in particular is, is our, our team captain on the chat. And uh, I will move on. Is there anything, so we have another Metameter question. Is there anything in particular that you are hoping we will cover today? Anything in particular that you are hoping we will cover today? Thank you. We've got our first response. Thank you for responding. Okay. Great training requirements, deadlines for inputting data. LWRS. What else are you hoping that we cover today? You're just open oh, a whole bunch of don't know what you don't know. Um, all the implementation questions you have for adding new staff members. Okay. All right. I am going to ask um, my team members, maybe Norman and Dan can uh, can respond with what we are covering today versus what the grant managers might follow up with you separately on or what we might be covering in session three. Uh, so today we, we, we are covering a significant portion of the grantee manual. As you know, we're dividing these uh, webinars into various sections of the of the grantee manual, we will talk about different roles, staff roles that need to be fulfilled as we go through the manual. So just uh, uh, stay focused, and we will specify the type of uh, staff that you need to have in order to fulfill the requirements of the various um, uh, stages of the program. So we'll we'll get going in a minute with uh, the next section 
and there we'll talk about some of the roles uh, uh, required for the program. Great. All right. Um, if you have any other questions, please feel free to email us and you can always contact your grant manager. I'll just leave that up for a second. Anything else before we move on? Thank you so much. I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Norman Ruano. Uh, thank you, Anna, for that very interactive uh, introductory sections here. We are going to get going here with some of the uh, very uh, important parts of the grantee manual. Uh, as you may remember, in webinar number one, we covered uh, the first three sections of the grantee manual. Today, we're going to be covering uh, some of the other sections, and we just want to give you an overview of what is found in the grantee manual. Obviously, this training and our discussion today does not replace the fact that it is very important that you and all of your staff review the grantee manual as published. You can find the grantee manual in the um, partner guide in the Illinois WorkNet system, and I would really encourage you uh, to go through that as you start implementing your program to ensure that not only are you following the guidance provided there, but that you're also uh, utilizing the tools and the best practices uh, described in that manual. Uh, and today, in this section, we're going to focus on section four of the grantee manual, which is outreach and recruitment. And by the end of this section, uh, you should be able to describe the role of outreach and recruitment in this, the pre-apprenticeship program. Program, excuse me, describe the types of participant leads and follow-up activities with each lead type, leverage outreach and recruitment resources, methods, samples, and tools to create a pipeline into the pre-apprenticeship program, learn to track outreach and recruitment efforts in the Illinois Works reporting system, integrate uh, DIBE, which is part of what we covered in the previous webinar, and the core and the six core values for our program into your program's outreach and recruitment. Uh, again, as I mentioned, this is section four of the grantee manual, which is called outreach and recruitment. Um, one of the key things I want to bring you back to, as you may remember, in the previous webinar, we introduced you to the pre-apprentice participant life cycle. Uh, the the pre-apprentice life cycle, it's a very important tool that we use to organize all the um, uh, guidance, all the materials, all the tools. But more importantly, it shows you how a particular individual interested in, in, in being part of your program, how they're supposed to be processed and the different steps that need to be followed. So today we're starting with the first step in the in the life cycle, which is outreach and recruitment. Outreach and recruitment provides potential participants with information about their pre-apprenticeship program with the objective of recruiting interested and qualified candidates to apply for the pre-apprenticeship program. Here again, this is, I just want to emphasize the words interested and qualified. Someone may be interested, but may not be qualified. Uh, we will discuss what the prerequisites are to be able to enter your program. And some people may be qualified, but not they may be interested, meaning they may not have the time uh, to, to dedicate to the program, but more importantly, may not be interested in making a career in construction. Unless they're both interested and qualified, they should definitely not be part of this program. This program is only for those individuals that are very interested in making a long-term career in construction and that are also qualified to do so. The grantee manual will provide you with information, techniques, and tools to help you and your program staff highlight the goals, program components, and core values of the Illinois Works Pre-Apprenticeship uh, Program. Uh, the goal of outreach and recruitment. Well, the goal is, the primary goal of, of these activities is to identify potential participants or participant leads. We're introducing here the concept of participant leads. Participant leads are individuals who may be interested in enrolling in your pre-apprenticeship program. The aim is to funnel leads through the screening process and transform qualified individuals from leads into applicants. So you will notice uh, Illinois Works because it's a structured program. Uh, the Illinois Works reporting system allows you to track from the very beginning not only partnerships that you're having in order to do 
outreach and recruitment, but more importantly, once you start talking to individuals, you need to be able to track those leads. And so we can see how those individuals are funneled through the system. Something I wanna emphasize here, you will notice that we ask you to track particular information about those leads. We'll get to that more in a minute, but we are required by law to report to the General Assembly and also to the Illinois Works Review Panel, which is a panel of appointed um, elected officials and community members. Uh, we're supposed to report to them the demographics of those individuals that we engage and they become part of our leads. Outreach and recruitment efforts may be first, maybe the first time potential participants will encounter the Illinois Works uh, Pre-Apprenticeship Program offered by your organization, your program instructors and your staff. It is very important that those individuals representing your program can articulate what the program has to offer as well as the value proposition for potential participants. So here's where we start talking about uh, staff. You should definitely have uh, staff that are dedicated to doing outreach and recruitment activities and that those individuals are not only knowledgeable about your program specifically, but Illinois Works in general. You are allowed to create your own materials. However, it may be relevant to know that Illinois Works provides several tools to assist to assist you, including there are three key uh, items that we provide in this section that are very relevant to your program. One is template number four, which is a sample marketing worksheet and timeline. As part of your onboarding, you'll be required to complete a marketing plan that you have to submit to your grant manager. Your grant manager will review it, provide feedback, and once it's finalized, uh, they will approve it so that you can execute it. It's very important that your marketing plan includes um, the underrepresented populations that your program was approved to serving. So this plan needs to be comprehensive and it also needs to have uh, funding attached to it. The second thing that you are required to do, and we provide a sample, you can certainly do different if you choose, it still has to be approved by your grant manager is a pre-apprenticeship program flyer. We wanna make sure that as you go out to events and partner with various organizations in the community that you have a professionally designed program flyer. So you will find in the grantee manual a sample program flyer that you could definitely use. And the third tool that we provide is the template number six, which is a sample Illinois Wars program information sheet. Different than your uh, flyer, the program information sheet provides comprehensive information about your program, the curricula, all the requirements, everything that will be of relevance for anybody interested in enrolling in your program. Once again, all of these items are being provided in the appendix of the 2024 grantee manual. Outreach and recruitment efforts should also focus on potential partners, including nonprofit organizations, employers, and others with the goal of growing your partner network. This is very important as you do outreach and recruitment as those partners are gonna become very important for you, uh, not only for bringing in uh, potential uh, enrollees, but at the same time, once those enrollees need services, be it wraparound services, student support services, or transition services, those partnerships uh, could definitely play a strategic role in your program and should play a strategic role in your program. So if you have not already started, think about who you could partner with in your community to make your program a success. Again, once again, the primary goal of outreach and recruitment activities is to identify participants or participant leads. What are leads? Leads are individuals who may be interested in enrolling in the pre-apprenticeship training program that you are putting together. The, the aim again is to funnel those leads through a screening process and transform qualified individuals from leads into applicants. Uh, we will talk about the screening and application process later in this webinar, but I just wanted to make sure that you understood the process those leads are, are supposed to go through. So let's talk about the various types of leads that we have encountered through the years uh, for your program. 
As you pursue your outreach and recruitment activities, it is helpful to understand your target audiences and how you might best communicate with them. This can help you maximize your efforts and get the best return on your outreach and recruitment efforts. Potential participants typically fall into one of four lead categories. Hot leads, individuals who have already decided they would like to apply for consideration as a pre-apprenticeship participant. So those are the hot leads. The warm leads are individuals who have shown some interest in being a pre-apprentice uh, pre -apprentice participant, but are not yet ready to apply. This might have, they might have responded to social media marketing and program staff have, have had some contact with them, but they may not be ready to apply to your program yet, except they're already a warm lead, they have an interest. Call leads, individuals who might have at first responded to marketing efforts, but the program, um, but the program staff have not been able to have contact with them or may have had some contact, but the person expressed little interest in the program. And then close leads, individuals who have definitely expressed a lack of interest in being a pre-apprenticeship program participant or did not pass the pre-screening process. So these are typically the four types of leads that we encounter out there as you're doing outreach and recruitment, close leads, call leads, warm leads, and hot leads. Why is understanding uh, these categories of leads so important? Well, you will notice uh, that it's very important because it has a very direct effect on the type of touches that you should have with these audiences. Like, what is a touch? A touch is um, uh, typically a communication that you have with a particular individual. Understanding your target audience is important because they help you inform your touches. The goal of your outreach and recruitment efforts is to transform qualified and interested leads into applicants. This is accomplished through consistent and strategic communication with potential applicants, also known as touches. So that type of strategic communication and consistent communication is what's uh, defined as a touch. A touch is any communication opportunity that motivates qualified individuals to apply. Your ultimate goal is for your leads uh, to become applicants, you know, to go from uh, cold or warm to hot and then become an applicant into your program. These are the different types of uh, touches that you typically will see uh, with your uh, leads. Social media post or connection, face-to-face -face conversation, uh, presentation, webinar, phone call, branded email, word of mouth, newsletter, blog post, text message, postcard, or a combination of those. It's very important that the staff that you have dedicated to doing your outreach and recruitment, it's staff that is qualified to uh, successfully communicate with your leads. What we know is that, uh, you know, the more you do these, the more successful you can be with converting your leads from cold to warm and from warm to hot. We know that programs that are very successful at recruiting uh, community members to their programs do a very good job at staying in touch with their potential applicants or their leads. Another thing that is a requirement and your grant manager will let you know and work with you as you continue to do your onboarding is um, a landing page. The Illinois Works Grantee Manual provides comprehensive guidance on outreach and recruitment methods. Uh, you could see guidance on page 72 of the manual related to this. One required component is the pre-apprentice program landing page. Organizations, uh, grantees, um, Organization websites will be one of the first locations potential participants will seek program information from. They are also linked to the Illinois Wars heat map and are part of the resources we make available to the public, which eventually results in the referrals we sent out to your program. So here's a good opportunity to understand how this marketing is integrated with our efforts at the Office of Illinois Works. So when you create a landing page, which is a requirement, 
that landing page uh, is placed on our program's website. It is also part of the heat map. The heat map is a tool, it's an electronic tool that we have on our website where community members or any other community stakeholders can go and look for information about our programs. We'll provide more information about the heat map later in the webinar, but what you should know is that that's part of our referral system. Once a community member or a stakeholder comes into all of that information, they have the option of being asked to get more information about our programs. They fill out an electronic form. Uh, my staff then monitors the email where all of that information is going, and the staff makes referrals to our programs on the ground. Last year alone, we issued 250 referrals to all of our grantees on the ground. Uh, please keep in mind that you are required to follow up and respond to those referrals within 24 hours after receiving them. And it's important that we very pro proactively do so, so that we don't lose out on those opportunities. And again, last year we issued 250 referrals to our grantees on the ground. And these are all community members interested in your programs. The grantee manual specifies that there should be a dedicated landing page for the Illinois Works Pre-Apprenticeship Program that clearly outlines program goals, requirements, application process, downloadable information sheets, and other key information. Please note that this page should be linked and included in social media posts or other outreach and recruitment materials. Uh, and as I said, our grant managers will be reaching out in the next couple of weeks to work with you to ensure that you have a landing page, that you have a flyer, uh, that you have an info sheet, and that you are ready to go for your outreach and recruitment activities. Uh, let's now do a Mentimeter uh, activity. If you could please stay logged on to Mentimeter. As you know, Mentimeter is the system that we use for interactivity. And I would like for you to now go to Mentimeter and answer the following question. What type of touches are part of your outreach and recruitment plan? Again, what type of touches are part of your outreach and recruitment plan? Uh, we have placed, uh, once again, the link for Menti, uh, Mentimeter in the chat, along with the code 34496165, 34496165. If you have not yet uh, joined Mentimeter, please go ahead and do so, so that we can um, uh, continue our interactivity here in the webinar. So I can already see some responses. Um, of what in, what you're including as part of your marketing and outreach efforts, boots on the ground, that's very important. It's a very, it's a vital thing to do to make sure that you know your community, that you interact with community stakeholders, boots on the ground, our, our fundamental website is definitely very important nowadays in modern, modern technology can really help you uh, recruit. Uh, social media, very important. Some of the uh, newer generations are particularly, um, uh, uh, good at, at navigating social media, so we need to make sure there's a presence there. Flyers, definitely, uh, flyers are very important. School counselors, yes, uh, school counselors can definitely refer great candidates to your programs. Um, what else? Uh, word of mouth, word of mouth is fundamental. You will find out that after you run your first cohort, even after your second cohort, maybe up to 50% of your leads may come from word of mouth uh, referrals. Uh, community-based organizations on the ground, certainly uh, partnering with community-based organizations, churches, and other organizations, are it, it's fundamental. Um, elected officials, yes, certainly elected officials have a good uh, network of how they reach out to communities. So putting flyers, uh, one-sheeters, uh, organizing events with elected officials' offices is also fundamental. Um, radio shows, certainly. Um, you know, uh, faith leaders, all of these are great uh, ways of engaging and all of these will be touches. Now, keep in mind that once you have the information, you've had contact with a particular individual, they become a lead, you will need to follow up with them. And that's where texting, that's where calling, that's where emailing, uh, social media posts, all of that becomes fundamental for them uh, to engage and become a uh, a hot lead and then become an applicant for your program. On average, we know uh, data, uh, even though data varies, 
uh, in our experience also uh, depends on, on where you are located. Uh, it takes between six to eight touches to convert a cold lead into an applicant. Uh, if someone is not uh, is not muted, if you could please mute yourself so that we don't have any interruption in the background. Uh, again, it takes anywhere between six to eight touches to convert a cold lead into an applicant. Now, the challenge is that typically after a third or four touch, nearly 90% of organizations stop trying. So it's important to continue uh, to work with those leads. And that's the reason why it's so important to have dedicated staff working on your uh, recruitment and outreach efforts. As would be expected, cold leads typically require more touches than warm leads, and warm leads typically require more touches than hot leads. Your program should not view the third or fourth touch as a failed attempt. Instead, these touches should be viewed as a countdown to the application process for qualified and interested individuals. Consider how this data might impact how you approach and outreach recruitment. One thing I can tell you, uh, very important, uh, when I used to do programming on the ground, we invested a significant amount of money, like all programs do, in uh, marketing, outreach, and recruitment efforts. If you let a lead go after two or three touches, you're gonna have to start trying all over again. A lot of times it's cheaper to finish communicating with that lead to convert them into a hot lead than to start all over again. And you may produce a bunch of cold leads or warm leads that you have to start the whole process with them. So it's important not to let go until you absolutely have to, uh, so that the investments that you're making in marketing, outreach, and recruitment are paying off. Uh, touches, so touches are not always intuitive when, how many, you know, which ones. However, it's important that based on your knowledge of the audience and your geographic location that you make those determinations so that you can become very good at recruiting the underrepresented uh, population that you need to serve. We have provided a tool uh, in the grantee manual table 10, uh, which addresses uh, lead follow-up steps and timelines. We recommend that you go and read that tool as uh, being shown right now on your screen and use it for your benefit. Okay, great, moving on. Let's talk about the heat map. I mentioned earlier that the heat map is a particular tool that we have in our website. Right now, the heat map is, is being updated because every time that we have a new network, there's a new heat map that gets produced. However, this is a very important tool, not only uh, for our referral system, but it is a very important tool for you to market your program. And as, a, as I mentioned, it's a requirement that you provide a landing page that then makes it into this uh, uh, heat map. This is one of the many tools that Illinois Works is making available to its grantees to support their success. This technology provides an overview of statewide demographic data, Illinois Works project data, as well as the location and essential information of Illinois Works pre-apprenticeship programs and DOL registered apprenticeship programs. Grantees can access information through this map uh, related to all Illinois Works pre-apprenticeship programs, the concentration of underrepresented populations in the state, the economic development regions that you are operating in, uh, Illinois Works projects by county. We update this map to include the projects uh, that are being executed, the construction projects that are being executed by county. Uh, we also uh, provide information about DOL registered apprenticeship programs throughout the state of Illinois. So if you are in a particular location and you want to know what DOL registered apprenticeship programs are run by the unions or other organizations in your community, you could find that out through this uh, heat map. And as I mentioned, it's under, it's being updated right now. So uh, the new uh, heat map uh, should be ready by March once all your landing pages have been finalized and all the other details have been entered into it. We'll publish uh, the new heat map and we'll let you know. We'll, we'll send out an announcement indicating once the new heat map has been updated. 
This map is utilized by both the pre-apprenticeship program and apprenticeship initiative to connect the public with local training programs, contractors with apprentices and grantees with DOL registered apprenticeship programs in the region. The maps coloring demonstrates the number of Illinois Works projects happening in each county with the dark pink symbolizing higher concentrations and darker teal representing lower concentrations. In other words, the larger concentrations of projects that are being executed are in the pink areas. Uh, the coloring is, is just um, uh, demonstrating the number of projects, uh, construction projects being executed in those areas. The red circles on the map represent the concentration of the underrepresented populations as outlined by the Illinois Wars Jobs Program Act, which includes women, individuals of color, and veterans. So those circles are where the underrepresented populations we're targeting are located. That's where we uh, strategically focus on placing pre apprenticeship programs to ensure that we're serving those populations. The blue squares represent apprenticeship programs, meaning DOL registered apprenticeship programs, and the yellow stars represent the Illinois Works funded pre-apprenticeship program. So when you go there, once the map is updated in March, you'll be able to locate your own program, but you'll be able to see where all of the other Illinois Works programs are located throughout the state. If you wanna see how your program is located in relation to DOL registered apprenticeship programs in those areas, then you'll see those in blue. The blue squares are DOL registered apprenticeship programs. Uh, and again, it's important that you uh, have a landing page with an information sheet and a flyer. Uh, all of that information will make it to the heat map uh, for the public to see. Okay, now another question here using Mentimeter. Given your target audience, what locations might be appropriate for distribution of either the flyers or information sheets? Given who you know, the audience you know, and the, and the organizations you know in your community, where would be a good idea uh, to distribute either flyers or information sheets or both? You can please log on to Mentimeter and answer that question, that would be great. That will help us uh, continue with our interactivity. Community centers, great. That's a place where a lot of people go. Um, local churches, certainly. Local churches are very, uh, um, embedded in the community and can give us access to a lot of those community members interested in entering the construction industry. Uh, housing department, certainly you could you could go there. There's a lot of people that go through those. High schools are a good place to recruit kids that have decided um, that making a, a career in construction is a good option for them. Uh, sometimes instead of going to uh, college. Um, let's see. Uh, Churches, community centers, high schools, nearby schools. Elected officials offices. Here's one that we found to be very successful. This may work better in uh, metropolitan areas than in other places, but we found that laundry mats are good places to distribute uh, flyers and information sheets. A lot of times you may not get to the younger populations by doing that, but you can certainly get to their parents. And a lot of times uh, uh, younger uh, 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 enrollees into our programs are directly referred by their parents. Uh, grocery stores are also a great place uh, to place those, uh, uh, those flyers and information sheets. Uh, you certainly have a good idea of who to who to work with in your community. Um, there's a lot of uh, um, IDS offices, social security offices, uh, you know, uh, uh, those those offices that uh, workforce centers that help people find employment when they're unemployed. All of those places are very good places to partner with. Uh, and, and, and drop off flyers, 
uh, and be able to provide information sheets. Thank you very much for participating. That was very, uh, very helpful. Um, next item is tracking participant outreach and recruitment. Outreach and recruitment are program requirements for Illinois Works. As a result, participant and partner engagement must be recorded in IWRS. As uh, you already know, we will be providing uh, very soon um, information about IWRS. You will go through a series of training webinars related to IWRS where you're going to learn how to do all of this. Uh, the primary goal, again, of outreach and recruitment activities is to identify potential participants or participant leads. Uh, and then I, your leads need to be entered into the Illinois Works reporting system. And I want to emphasize here, we cannot have programs just enter applicants into IWRS. You need to enter your leads. We are required to report your leads and their demographic data to the Illinois General Assembly. We have to issue an annual report for Illinois Works and also four reports to the review panel, the Illinois Works review panel throughout the year. And we are required to report demographic information for those individuals. Um, and again, Illinois Works is the is the reporting and, and program management system that is required to be used by all grantees. It's a customized system designed specifically for our Illinois Works pre-apprenticeship program. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, guidance related to this and how to enter this information in Illinois Works uh, is provided in the grantee manual, but also we'll be training you on how to do that through IWRS webinars that will be upcoming. Uh, on the screen, you will notice a screenshot of IWRS that shows how a lead, how to add a lead into the system. Uh, grantees will first enter the individual's name, contact information, and their lead status. Is it a hot lead? Is it a warm lead? Is it a cold lead? Is it a closed lead? Document follow-up dates and, we'll, uh, and, and add case notes if applicable. Once the contact information and lead type are chosen and submitted, the pre-screen assessment will populate. It is not until the pre-screen assessment is completed that the individual is officially added into IWRS. So let's discuss what the pre-screen assessment is. Uh, you may remember I mentioned earlier that not only is it important for individuals to be interested in construction as a career, but also to be qualified to enter this program. And the pre-screen assessment specifically um, is the, the one that helps us do that. After outreach and recruitment activities, yet before the application is the pre-screening. The pre-screen assessment falls under the outreach and recruitment stage of the pre-apprentice life cycle. The pre-screening process provides information regarding outreach and recruitment efforts, and it allows grantees to gather basic information regarding leads and determine if a potential applicant meets the basic requirements of the program. The pre-screen assessment asks six questions to determine basic eligibility and gathers leads demographic information in keeping with the Illinois Works Jobs Program Act requirements. Uh, one of the key things, again, here we're trying to determine interest and qualification. Are they interested in construction as a career? Are they qualified? Remember, as I mentioned, if we have interest and no qualification, they're not a good candidate for the program. If they're qualified, but they're not interested, they're not a good uh, candidate for the program. They need to have both. So these are the questions that you're that the pre-screen assessment will ask. Do you have an interest in making a career in the construction industry? Yes or no? If someone says, yes, but I wanna be a chef, you know, certainly not a good candidate for Illinois Works. If someone says, yes, but I'll be interested in being a CN CNC operator at a manufacturing company, they are not a good candidate for Illinois Works. Uh, just because they may have an interest doesn't mean and they express an interest doesn't mean that they're a good candidate. You need to be able to see that their interest really aligns with having a career in construction in the trades. Question number two, do you have the ability to attend the program? That's very important. Someone may be interested, may even have the other prerequisites, but they do not have the ability or they don't have the time 
to attend the program. You know, um, we've seen cases where uh, programs accept individuals into their programs, but they're also enrolled in college. Guess what? The minute they have a, a, a midterm or a final for one of their college courses, the one that they're going to sacrifice is not likely their college career, but Illinois works. And we uh, definitely should not uh, enroll that individual into the program unless they have the ability to attend the program. The third question is, do you have a high school diploma or GED or HICED? Let me just tell you something that is very important. You cannot take this question lightly, okay? If you accept an individual into the program that does not have a high school uh, diploma or a GD or high school certificate, they may successfully complete your program, but when we do a final audit of that graduate, they would not be considered a graduate because they do not have this prerequisite. More important, they wouldn't be able to transition to a DOL registered apprenticeship program. Most, if not all, DOL registered apprenticeship programs in the state of Illinois require that individuals have a high school diploma or GD or high set. They may say, I'm gonna go through the program and then I'm gonna get my GD or high set. That is not acceptable. They need to have a high school diploma, GD or high set certificate before they enroll to the program. The other one, are they at least 18 years of age? This is very important. If they are not at least 18 years of age, they cannot be enrolled in the program. The only exception to this rule is if you are a high school based uh, Illinois Works pre apprenticeship program. And if you are a high school based DOL registered apprenticeship program, we gave you special permission to have uh, individuals that are less than 18 years of age participate. But that's the only exception to that rule. Are they an Illinois resident? This is a very important question. We have a lot of programs that run um, and they're close to borders with Wisconsin, with Iowa, with Indiana. If they are not an Illinois resident, they cannot participate, unfortunately. How did you hear about this program? So the first five questions, uh, they need to be able to answer yes to all of those first five questions in order for them to be able to be eligible to participate in, in the program, and then they can proceed to complete an application for the program. If any of those five questions is a no, they cannot proceed to completing an application in the system. And then the last question is, how did you hear about this program? This is important for us because we are able to then see uh, how, what efforts, what marketing efforts, what outreach strategies are more successful for different programs throughout the state. So uh, once they have answered all those questions, all of those uh, answers need to be entered in Illinois Works. If the participant met uh, program requirement eligibility, the grantee will then uh, be prompted in the system uh, to do the following, to enter the following. The date the pre-screening was conducted, the participant's gender and the participant's race or ethnicity. Once the assessment is completed, the individual will be added to IWRS as an inquiry. At this point, the grantee can leave the individual as an inquiry if the participant is not ready to complete the application. Alternatively, if the participant is ready to move forward, the grantee can choose to move on to the next step, which is completing a program application. Are there any questions about the content that I just covered. Do we have any questions in the chat, Monica? No, Norman, no, there are no questions in the chat. Okay, something very important. Sometimes you go and do outreach activities, um, you know, at a particular event, a community event, a church event, and obviously you don't have a laptop or you may not have a laptop with you. You can complete the pre-assessment uh, manually, hard copy, um, and then you are required to enter that information into IWRS within 24 hours of completion. Uh, you can find the hard copy uh, and also instructions of the pre-screening assessment in the partner guide in Illinois WorkNet. Uh, any questions before we proceed to the next section? Either unmute your line or enter it in the chat and I'll be more than happy to answer any questions you may have. 
before we Norman, proceed to the next section. Yes. I'm sorry. There is one question in the chat. Uh, Rochelle asks, is there a section for those identifying as non-binary? Uh, we, we do have, um, yes, there is a section. We do collect uh, data on individuals that identify as non-binary. Okay. Are there any other questions? If there are no other questions, now we will move on to the next uh, uh, step in the pre-apprentice life cycle, and I will hand it over to my colleague, uh, Dan Martinez, who will go on and, and deliver that section. Hi, Norman. I'm sorry. This is LaShonda. I have a quick question. Yes, that's okay. Um, high school diplomas and GEDs from out of the country meet eligibility requirements as well for the pre-apprenticeship? Uh, GED, typically GED obviously is an American um, United States. Yeah. yeah, high school diplomas from other parts of the country. The challenge, the challenge with that is, again, is not what we will accept, is what DOL registered apprenticeship programs will accept. My understanding is that most DOL registered apprenticeship programs will accept only American based high school credentials. Uh, I've heard of some programs that are willing to accept uh, high school credentials from other countries that have been um, uh, accredited. You know, there's a whole process individuals can do to do that. Uh, to be on the safe side, I would uh, definitely go with American based high school. Uh, uh, diplomas in a GED or high set, uh, or high set certificate, because, uh, ultimately what we want is to not build bridges to nowhere for our graduates. And it's not about us. It's about what DOL registered apprenticeship programs accept. Uh, later on in the process, we will provide for you a manual that we have. And unfortunately we do not have it for the whole state is a manual put out by another nation that lists all of the requirements to enter a lot of uh, DOL registered apprentice programs in the state, and you'll be able to see there what their requirements are, and most of them uh, mainly accept American based credentials for those. So, then, Martinez, if you could please go ahead uh, with your next section. Great. Thank you very much, Norman. So, we are going to be talking about um, the uh, section five of the grantee manual, the program application, uh, the grantee manual uh, section objectives for uh, this module are to leverage standardized tools and templates, including the program application, interview questionnaire, acceptance letter, uh, conditional acceptance letter and denial letter, uh, reference the eligibility requirements that Norman has touched on already for program participation. Uh, complete an uh, application and intake requirements, including the pre screen assessment application or the pre screen assessment, the application, the standardized interview, uh, all in the Illinois works reporting system. We're not going to be training on the Illinois works reporting system. Of course, that is uh, for another uh, web webinar. Uh, we're also going to uh, use the Illinois works pre apprenticeship. A drug test policy to keep participants safe and uh, better prepare them for transitions into registered apprenticeship programs and employment. And then we'll be talking about the intake process in the next section. So, uh, before I begin, do, does anyone have any questions about uh, what we're going to be covering in this uh, module? Okay, again, feel free to enter questions in the chat and at the end of every section, we will cover them. If it's a question that is uh, really relevant to the topic that we're covering, uh, feel free to unmute your line and, uh, and ask, your, ask your question. So, uh, we'll review the program application uh, section 5 of the 2024 grantee manual. So here we are with the participant life cycle again, as you, uh, you all know, you'll become very familiar with this. The Illinois works programs uh, application process is designed to enroll participants. Who are able and ready to make a career in construction and the trades. 
the Illinois Works application process is the next logical step after that pre-screen assessment, which was conducted during outreach and recruitment uh, and that particular stage of the pre-apprenticeship life cycle. So once that participant is determined to be a hot lead, they can begin that application process. So step one, uh, if applicants meet the pre-screening assessment requirements, they will complete the program application. The application can be completed by the applicant electronically with the assistance of the outreach and recruitment coordinator or as a paper application. And I should mention a little window into the program. As many of you are aware, the Illinois Works reporting system is built on uh, Illinois WorkNet. But unlike some other Illinois WorkNet programs, the participants will never be accessing IWRS directly. It'll always be through your uh, staff. So the outreach recruitment coordinator, transition service coordinator, uh, data entry coordinators, et cetera. Uh, but after completing that pre-screen assessment, uh, IWRS will prompt the outreach and recruitment coordinator to begin the application process. I think Norman had covered that a little bit. Like if you're ready to move on, uh, you're able to. If you're not, they can stay, remain as an inquiry. So if you're ready to move on, the application is can, can be completed directly into IWRS, as I mentioned, or they can utilize a paper version of that application that's available on the Illinois Works Partner Guide. Uh, if the grantee uh, opts to use the paper version for the participants or the applicants at this point, the applicant responses must be entered into IWRS within 24 hours of the application's completion. So again, that goes back to the, the timely uh, entering of, of data. I think that was actually one of the uh, Mentimeter results that uh, you, know, uh, you all were looking for uh, to find out about this program. When do things need to be entered? What types of things? How do we begin intake? So uh, I'm glad we're able to cover all of that right now. Uh, then continuing with the program application, uh, grantees will request and retain information from the applicant that will confirm those eligibility requirements, such as age, uh, Illinois residency, and the high school diploma, GED, or high set. The application uh, will, um, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> the application also is part of the request for information that does not necessarily dis disqualify the applicant from participating but will be important for grantees to counsel the participant uh, on or offer maybe a referral uh, for assisting them. So we'll discuss some of those in, in just a moment. Uh, it, it's important to know, again, that as we go through these, some of these are not disqualifying, they're more considerations. So I'll address each one as we go. Uh, first off with age, that is an eligibility requirement. Norman covered that. Uh, very well, but participants must be at least 18 years of old unless they're with a specifically approved high school based program that can admit participants that are under the age of 18 in their senior year. However, uh, even those participants must be 18 upon the completion of the program. So for you, you must can obtain and keep in the participants physical file documentation of the participants age. So whether that's a birth certificate or a driver's license or a state ID, uh, some form of official uh, documentation. The high school GED high set requirement. Again, that is an eligibility requirement. So uh, they must have their high school diploma or GED proof of high set prior to entering uh, Illinois Works, uh, the pre-apprenticeship program. And again, the specially approved high school based graduate uh, grantees can enroll individuals while they earn their, that diploma. Uh, but for all other grantees, you must have that prior to beginning the program. And in fact, it, we'll cover this in the IWRS training, but you'll be required to upload that documentation as part of the intake and as part of our verification that you've successfully enrolled the individual. Um, uh, and again, to recap on Lashonda's question, um, the, the essentially the requirement there for most um, non-accredited uh, foreign high school diplomas 
uh, would be for that individual to obtain their GED in the United States. And again, all of this must occur prior to uh, application and uh, they must be able to state that. And then during the application process, you're, you're required to correct, collect that information. Uh, the driver's license, as I mentioned, uh, that's more of a consideration that we use that, of course, to identify uh, their age. Uh, but not having the driver's license does not automatically disqualify individuals. But it does speak to the fact that transportation could be an issue, not only during the program, but after the program. As Norman just mentioned, right, we're not building a bridge to nowhere. So the individuals need to know that most employment in the construction industry uh, requires driving to a job site, right? It's not like uh, getting a job at a, a manufacturing location where you know where you're going to work every day uh, and you can establish a bus route or, or train or even carpooling. That doesn't necessarily work for construction. You might be driving an hour north one week and literally the next week be driving an hour west uh, to your job site. So um, that has to be part of the consideration and part of your counseling and, and referral uh, for wraparound services. Uh, a social security number. So this is again, not an eligibility requirement, but a consideration. Illinois works requests, but does not require applicants to provide a social security number. If the participant does not provide one or does not have one, this does not disqualify them from participating in the program. However, lack of a social security number uh, will bar them from admittance into certain US DOL registered apprenticeship programs. So this should be discussed, uh, should be addressed in discussing career plans. And again, part of if they're in the program, part of the wraparound services, counseling them as to what the path forward can be. Uh, reliable transportation, this kind of goes hand in hand with the, uh, the driver's license discussion. So this again is a consideration. The lack of reliable transportation does not automatically disqualify individuals and certainly plans can be created and should be created to ensure that the participant has reliable transportation during the program, but it also needs to encompass a, a path forward for that individual beyond the program. Drug testing, again, a consideration, not an eligibility requirement. So candidates will be asked in the application if they are able to pass a drug screening. Grantees must have the ability to administer or send participants for drug testing if required based on criteria outlined in the grantee manual. And even failing a drug test does not automatically disqualify candidates from the Illinois Works Pre-Apprenticeship Program. However, testing positive may make a transition into a DOL registered apprenticeship program more difficult and grantees should counsel the participant on that potential impact. Uh, we'll discuss this a little bit more and, and you know, the safety considerations and, and uh, things like that uh, in a little bit. Uh, English profic proficiency. Uh, this is an eligibility requirement. Participants should be able to actively participant, participate in training in English. If applicants do not believe they can participate in English, grantees should refer the applicant to a partner they can assist them in increasing their English proficiency and continue to engage with them to understand when they will be ready to, uh, to enter the Illinois Works Pre-Apprenticeship Program or apply further. And then time availability. So this is an acceptance requirement, right? This is, again, Norman touched on, right? If, they're, if you know they're also taking college courses or have other things that they are, are doing, um, can they fully participate? Can they meet the attendance requirements? So, uh, you know, they obviously must be able to participate in all required pre-apprenticeship instruction, whether that's the classroom instruction, the, the construction laboratory, job site, work site-based learning, uh, also required student support services and, and transition activity service that, services that are required by your program. So it's very important to discuss with potential applicants the time commitment 
that will be involved and ensure that they have that ability to uh, participate fully in the program. Um, again, if individuals cannot be accepted into the program, you know, for whatever reason, uh, it's important to uh, utilize your network of partners and service organizations to refer the individual for assistance, uh, whether it's to um, resolve the issue that has prevented them from being uh, able to participate or to help them in other avenues of a career path. So the next step will be uh, establishing a, an interview. We refer to it as the standardized interview. Once the grantee has been has determined that the applicant is eligible for the program and has been offered relevant counseling or referrals around the application consideration, the applicant moves to the next stage of the process. So the standardized interview allows the grantee to gather additional insight into the applicant's interests, their long-term goals, uh, what the participant hopes to gain from the pre-apprenticeship program. And grantees must use the Illinois Works pre-apprenticeship program provided questionnaire. It's exhibit four in the grantee manual, uh, and it's available on the partner guide, of course. The interview questionnaire includes 10 questions, each worth four points. So a total score, obviously, then of 40 points is, is possible. The interview must be conducted by at least two staff members who will separately record the applicant's answers and then provide indep independent scores for each question. The interviewer total scores are then averaged to gain one total score for the application. Again, the maximum average, it would be 40 coming from both of the interviewers and the minimum score for acceptance into the program would be 32. Individuals with an average score of less than 32 should not be admitted into the program unless there are significant mitigating factors that can be resolved. The final interview score and both the interview questionnaires names must uh, and interview sheets must be uh, entered into IWRS. So the score and names are entered in and the questionnaires are scanned and uploaded into IWRS. So if your program chooses, and we'll talk a little bit more about this in the acceptance letters, but if your program chooses to enroll a student with mitigating factors, these factors, as well as the reason for enrollment and what's being done um, to, to you know, adjust these factors must be documented in the applicant's IWRS profile. And no more than 20% of a cohort can be admitted under that category. So um, obviously they're a little bit higher risk and uh, we need to maintain um, you know, a, a risk uh, profile there. So here are some items to keep in mind when administering interviews. Uh, they can be administered by staff members or contractors, but they need to be working with the Illinois Works Pre-Apprenticeship Program. Interviews can take place in person which is preferred, but they can also take place via a phone call or a virtual call like Zoom or this WebEx. Interviewers do not have to administer the interview separately, right? There do need to be two interviews, but they can conduct the interview at the same time, which is actually preferable so that we can ensure scoring consistency, right? The, the participant didn't give two different answers for the same question that way. And uh, the interview interview sheets can only be completed by the staff member or contractor that's conducting the interview. It is not permissible to allow the participants to um, fill out their own answers on that participant sheet and then later have the staff member uh, scoring the, those uh, those answers. The next step uh, would be then your enrollment decisions. So once they've completed their application and, and gone through the interview process, the admissions team will then make the final enrollment decision. So enrollment decisions should be accompanied with a formal letter from your program that uh, clearly communicates the enrollment decision. So we have full acceptance. That's for applicants who met all of the requirements of the program and received the 32 uh, average score or higher on their standardized interview. And then we have conditional acceptance, 
I mentioned there that uh, those are for applicants maybe that received um, less than uh, 32 on the standardized interview, but are be ex being accepted under the mitigating factors category. Now, these applicants still have the willingness and ability to complete all program requirements uh, by the end of the program. So, uh, one example would be maybe an individual not having a driver's license, uh, but wanting to obtain it and having, you know, the ability to obtain it. They maybe they just need some help um, through our wraparound services. We're able to provide assistance, maybe assisting them with, uh, you know, paying for driver's lessons, or maybe there is, um, you know, a, a barrier with the secretary of state that needs to be cleared and, and you can assist them with that either uh, through the work or, or monetarily. So those are things that can happen, but then they, you know, that that conditional acceptance needs to clearly outline that and be a basis for their dismissal if they choose not to clear that that mitigating factor. Um, then denial, of course, is for applicants that do not meet or cannot or are not willing to meet all the program requirements. Uh, this also applies to any applicant that met uh, that received a score of less than 31 uh, on the standardized interview and, and there aren't mitigating factors that can allow them to be accepted conditionally. So there are templates available in the grantee manual for each of these uh, full acceptance is template 9 uh, conditional acceptance is template 10 and the denial is template 11. So, um, the next item to discuss is not actually an enrollment decision, but it's relevant uh, to note. So, an administrative withdrawal, uh, that is a status in the Illinois Works Reporting System, and it's a condition where the uh, grantee offered the participant uh, acceptance and enrollment into the program, or acceptance into the program, and the participant commits to attend, but never shows up for that first day. All right, so um, that's a very important distinction. If they show up for the first day, even one day, doesn't matter whether they show up one day or for the first month or for you know everything, but you know the last month, uh, they're not administrative withdrawals. These administrative withdrawals are only individuals that were offered acceptance in the program but never attended instruction. All right. Um, so it's important to note that uh, they do not count toward your enrollment metric and as a performance based uh, grant that's those enrollment metrics are extremely important. And so administrative withdrawals do not count towards those because they never actually began instruction and to avoid that situation, make sure that when you're accepting individuals into the program, they're made very aware of the you know, dates and times of orientation and all the critical programming information for the class schedule. Now, it's also very important as we're talking about the, um, the interviews and uh, screening processes that uh, you guard against participant skimming. Participant skimming is when programs select applicants who they believe are more likely to succeed uh, because maybe they have uh, less need for other wraparound services or supportive services. And, um, you know, it's important to know that those things should not be taken into consideration for enrollment, right? Unless they are part of those eligibility or considerations that we just discussed that maybe turn into mitigating factors. But we, we definitely do not want um, you know, this program entry to be a barrier that we're trying to overcome, right? So uh, please keep that in mind. So next, we're going to talk about the cohort structure. Uh, the the uh, L Office of Illinois Works uses a cohort structure for the pre-apprenticeship program to provide programming. So this is in contrasting to, to a rolling enrollment model. The cohort structure is based on a predefined limited group of students engaged in an area of study, right, under the guidance of, uh, of a, a single programming instructor or trainers uh, that provide them with that um, individualized instruction. Cohorts work together 
in the same academic program, progressing through the same academic curriculum at the same time. That means that they start and they end the program together. Uh, in contrast, a rolling enrollment structure allows new applicants that have been accepted into the program to start at the point of admission. So there's no hard deadline. They, you know, the, the, the rest of the cohort started, uh, you know, February 5th, but, you know, another individual is going to be starting today on February 6th, and then maybe there are more that are going to be starting next week. So um, participants are unlikely to have the same academic experience and they won't complete the program at the same time uh, or at the same pace uh, when you when uh, organizations utilize a rolling enrollment structure. So while there are some benefits to it, uh, Illinois Works pre-apprenticeship program uh, leverages the structure of the cohort model. And th this structure is shown to create a, a sense of belonging. It's, it involves more collaborative learning. It, it creates more self-efficacy uh, and even a desire to complete the program with other cohort members, right? It's more of a self-sustaining model. And uh, this model has a, a very positive impact on retention. It aligns with the Illinois Works core values and the diversity, inclusion, belonging, uh, and equity that we're striving towards. So as a result, uh, it's the cohort structure that is approved and the rolling enrollment is not approved for Illinois Works pre-apprenticeship grantees. So as mentioned previously, I said we were gonna talk a little bit more about drug testing. Uh, candidates will be asked uh, in the application if they are able to pass a drug screening. Grantees must have the ability to administer or send participants uh, for drug testing if required based on the criteria that are outlined in the grantee manual. Failing, as I, I mentioned this before, failing a drug test does not disqualify candidates from the Illinois Works Pre Apprenticeship Program, but it makes that transition to registered apprenticeship programs much more difficult, if not impossible. So grantees need to be uh, need, need to ensure that they can counsel participants on the potential impacts. And there are two major reasons that we were bringing this up. And the first is that due to the nature of uh, the training space and what this program is about, uh, specifically the construction labs and worksite experiences, uh, the hands-on uh, uh, with tools, it is imperative for safety reasons that participants are not under the influence of substances that can impair their performance or that may result in the harm of themselves or the harm of others, right? So that is um, very important to keep in mind. Uh, but, and then the other that we, you know, have mentioned several times is that the ultimate goal of the Illinois Works Pre-Apprenticeship Program are for graduates to then transition into registered apprenticeship programs. And even if uh, sometimes they're not able to go into registered apprenticeship programs right away, they do go into other construction em employment and uh, drug use in, in those fields um, can cause them to be not denied enrollment or employment or fired from their positions, right? So uh, this will make it extremely difficult and, and just can't you know, be allowed. So if substances are identified in results of a random drug test or a, a qualified drug test, the grantee should first counsel the participant about their ability and willingness to stop drug use, given the exact reasons we're talking about, right? They're adults, they should know that safety is an issue and they have to be responsible for that. And their transition into construction is an issue and that's the reason that they're there. So um, those should be things that they're counseled about. They should, um, you know, also, uh, the grantee should also identify whether the participant has attended any uh, programs under the influence and put themselves or others at risk? And if so, the grantee can take disciplinary action. So although it's not an immediate qualifier, um, uh, disqualifier, uh, drug use, failure of, uh, uh, to pass a drug test or uh, attending the program under the influence uh, can and should result in, in disciplinary action. And some of that can be up to dismissal. And so I encourage 
all the programs to ensure that they have a policy uh, for this so that it can be clearly uh, provided to the participants and so that it can be adhered to. So any questions before we move to the next section and discuss intake? I know we covered a lot there. There's no questions in the chat, Dan. Okay, perfect. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Uh, so our next section will be discussing uh, section five of the manual, uh, the intake. And in this section, we'll give it just another second. I know the um, the, the slides don't always transition as quickly as we would like them to. Um, so in this section, we're going to be discussing the importance and tasks related to the intake process uh, and including building rapport within the cohort and then discussing DIBE and the six core values that are um, and incorporating them into the elements of your program's application and intake process. Uh, so, again, we're staying in section 5 of the 2024 grantee manual. So, intake on the pre apprenticeship participant life cycle um, during this process uh, will focus on the intake staff and case managers, the wraparound service coordinator and meeting with participants 1 on 1. Uh, and that leads us to rapport building and assessing participants' needs and establishing wraparound supports, uh, supports to address those needs uh, through the, um, the Illinois Works Pre-Apprenticeship Wraparound Service Assessment. So this starts with an intake meeting. Uh, intake meetings serve as a key moment in building a positive cohort culture. It's important to remember that the intake meeting uh, maybe the first time pro program staff are interacting with individuals um, and definitely the first time they're interacting with them now as a full fledged pre apprenticeship program participant right prior to that they were applicants. So, during this intake meeting uh, grantees will explain the wraparound services that are available to them. That's an important part, right? Because then the participants are going to be. Um, uh, filling out the wraparound service assessment. So they need to know what the services are available to them before they can uh, conduct that assessment. Uh, a detailed description of the wraparound service assessment and uh, available services will be provided in the next section. This meeting will set the tone for the overall program, right? Building that culture. It's important that the participants see and feel the DIBE components as well as all aspects of the core values. So, building rapport with participants. Uh, rapport is the creation of a professional relationship that features mutual understanding between one another, features a connection that results in a trusting relationship between the program instructors, the staff, and the program participants, and then within the, the program participants themselves. So, building rapport is essential to creating a, a program culture that really fosters that belonging, the inclusion, and the collaboration. Uh, intake meetings are an ideal space for your program staff to really begin establishing that, that rapport. Dan, while you're pausing, may I ask a question, please? Sure. Okay, Corey in the chat asks, um, he wants to go back to drug testing for a moment. Is it acceptable for an organization to drug test their participants or do they have to be tested by a third party? Uh, it is uh, acceptable. If, if you have the uh, capability to conduct your own drug tests, then yes. Or yeah, So that's kind of the expectation. If either you're available to do it or you've established yourself with a partner or lab or something that can uh, conduct those tests. Okay. I'm sorry, I don't know if it was somebody asking a question or are they just off a of mute accidentally? If if you're asking a question, if you could speak up. 
Dan, I'm sorry. I think I was off mute. It's fine. If I, <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> okay. All right. So no question. Excellent. Um, so let's move on. The next uh, Mentimeter question. Uh, it's so important in the engagement, but we're going to do it quickly. I don't want to skip it because it it is um, it, it's one of those things where we can all learn from one another. But uh, so let's move to that just very quickly. Hopefully, you're all still in Mentimeter. Again, please don't log out during these sessions. Uh, if you are, the the link's been placed back in the chat. Uh, again, there's a link there that's just a direct link, so you don't have to enter the code. So if we can move to Mentimeter. And what techniques uh, do you use or will you use to build rapport with your program participants? So what, what techniques do you use or will you use to build rapport with your program participants? So um, if you have something uh, top of mind, please go ahead and share it. We're only going to uh, spend uh, maybe 30, 45 seconds on this, um, but it, it's so important we can learn from one another and I know you all have, you know, great ideas. So, um, let's take a look at this. Uh, we have some suggestions rolling in already. Thank you so much. Uh, face to face meetings. Absolutely nothing, you know, builds rapport like that in person. That's 1 of the reasons we held our Naperville orientation, right? Icebreakers certainly, uh, it's a great way to. Uh, get the participants uh, relaxed and, and um, familiar with one another and the staff. Uh, breakout groups, mentoring smaller group settings, that's perfect. Regular check-ins, calling them by their name. Everyone enjoys that, that direct uh, connection. So th these are wonderful. Um, group meetings and icebreakers, absolutely luncheons. That kind of begins that informal uh, icebreaking as well, right? Sometimes just sharing food with one another is a great way of doing that. Um, showing them that you genuinely care about them, right? Being honest, being sincere, um, encouragement and engagement. Thank you so much. One-on-one um, -on -one sessions, finding com uh, commonalities, developing mentorship, regular conversations, uh, getting family involved. Certainly nobody does this alone, right? Um, no matter what stage of life they're in, um, it probably is going to involve support from their family and friends. So that's wonderful. Uh, thank you all so much. All right, we're going to move on uh, to our next section. Uh, I think, well, first I'll, I'll stop and pause for any uh, final questions before we do move on to our next section. But I want to thank you all so much for this uh, engagement. It really, uh, you know, talking about building rapport, right? I mean, that's what this does for us all. And I think you guys do a wonderful job uh, of engaging and I really appreciate it. So thank you so much for um for, for your comments and thoughts in Mentimeter. So before we proceed to the next section and I hand uh, the microphone back off to uh, Norman, are there any questions regarding the content that I covered or any, anything else within the, the, um, the session so far today? No? Okay, um, and again, one uh, last thing again before I uh, hand it off to, to Norman. We will be taking a break uh, after this next section. So for those of you that are wondering uh, what the timeline looks like, we will be taking a short break uh, after in about um, uh, 15 minutes or so. So uh, Norman, are you available? Yes, thank you, Dan. I appreciate the, uh, that facilitation, that very interactive facilitation. We're moving on now to uh, module number six, uh, which covers section six of the grantee manual, uh, participant wraparound services. Uh, Gia, would you please move uh, to the, I would appreciate it. Okay, this section, I mean, yes. Can you see, see, okay, awesome. You can see the, I cannot Current. see the okay. slide. I cannot see the slide. I can see Mentimeter. Okay. Let me stop sharing and resharing because it should be sharing the PowerPoint slide. Okay. So as uh, Gia uh, deals with that, uh, in this section in particular, we're going to discuss uh, the three key objectives of that uh, section six of the grantee manual. Uh, which is complete a wraparound service assessment and deliver wraparound services. 
provide additional support for participants with complex needs and comply with the Illinois Works guidance related to performance-based stipends. Thank you, G. I can see the slide now. Uh, one key important thing about this section is uh, when it comes to Illinois Works, the model that Illinois Works operates with, it's a model that is uh, very focused on ensuring that we help individuals overcome barriers. Uh, wraparound services and student support services are very strategic in helping us achieve that goal. So it's very important that your program has a robust wraparound service uh, system to ensure that we can provide the services needed for our uh, participants. So wraparound services are very important, but assessing participant needs for wraparound services is critical, is a critical part of the intake process. We have discussed earlier, and you wanted to know about some of the key staff that will be involved. Uh, wraparound services uh, are delivered through a role that we call wraparound service coordinator. Uh, typically, um, a lot of people on the ground call them case managers. Uh, we call them wraparound service coordinators here at, these, at Illinois Works, so just keep that in mind. And again, this is part of the pre-apprentice life cycle. We have already covered outreach recruitment application intake, and now we are in the wraparound services section of the uh, participant life cycle. So wraparound services and support that addresses non-academic needs, very important here. We differentiate between academic needs, which are student support services, and we'll get to those later, but right now we're talking about wraparound services to address non-academic needs, to reduce or eliminate barriers for entrance and success in DOL registered apprenticeship programs. It could include an array of options and we'll discuss those in a minute. One thing I do want to emphasize is that the wraparound service model we use at Illinois Works is called an opt into uh, model. In other words, opt in, uh, you can uh, opt in to receive certain services. We do not use the model, and I know other programs may use those models where uh, there in, there's an assessment done, and then the case manager says, you need this, you need that, you need that, and here it is. That's not the model that we use at Illinois Works. At Illinois Works, participants have to opt into a particular service, and that is achieved through the wraparound services uh, assessment that we conduct. Uh, as a result, because of this model, wraparound services cannot be assumed or imposed. In other words, you cannot assume that all of your participants need um, you know, bus cards, or you cannot assume that they all need train cards, so you cannot assume that they all need gas cards. They need to be able to opt in based on their needs. Um, we um, typically, when our Office of Grant Management reviews expenses on wraparound services, they're ensuring that we're not just giving wraparound services to everybody in the program. We give, we give those services to people that need them, and they opted into those uh, based on need. The opt-in model requires participants to meet with a wraparound service coordinator one-on-one -on -one and establish services during the program while beginning planning to address these needs long-term. This is a very important point. Why is it so important that we address needs and only needs? You may remember, once they exit our program, be it because they withdrew, they were dismissed, or they successfully completed it, that they're now graduates, those services are no longer available. And it is very important for us for them to have a sustainable way of making it through a DOL registered apprenticeship program and succeeding in it. If all of a sudden we provide a variety of services they don't need, uh, and those, those services end by the time the program ends, what happens afterwards? Are they able, are they ready to be able to succeed without those services during the DOL register apprenticeship program tenure. Most DOL register apprenticeship programs last anywhere between three to five years. So it's very important that we have strategies long-term for sustainability so that our graduates can sustain themselves uh, once they complete our program and move on to DOL registered apprenticeship programs. Uh, so it's important to understand that there is a wraparound service assessment that needs to be conducted. This assessment must be completed with each participant 
as part of the intake process, it is required to be a face-to-face -face activity and with the wraparound service coordinator. Whoever is playing that role in your, in your program needs to meet face-to-face -face with each of your uh, participants to conduct the wraparound service assessment. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, you will be instructed on IWRS. Uh, you will find uh, instructions on how to complete that assessment, both uh, in the partner guide in Illinois WorkNet, but also in the grantee manual. Uh, uh, part of what, what's very important here is once you are completing this uh, assessment face-to-face, -face, uh, you know, it's important to know that needs change for individuals as your program progresses. As a result, participants can opt in and out of a particular wraparound service at any point during the active enrollment in their program. If a participant chooses to opt in to a new service, the service can be manually added to the participant's wraparound service goal in IWRS. And again, we will um, uh, train you on how to do that, but because needs change for individuals, they may opt in and out of services at a given uh, moment in time during the program. Grantees must offer, this is very important, at a minimum, grantees must offer internally or through partnerships each of the following wraparound services. Transportation costs, child care, family member care, technology assistance for virtual learning, broadband and hardware, driver's license education fees, financial literacy, digital literacy, very important that, as I mentioned earlier, that we sustain those minimum services. You will find the whole section in the grantee manual that discusses each of these pre-approved services. If there are any limits on how much you can spend on those services, it mentions it there on the grantee manual. If grantees require more services above and beyond the list that I just provided, okay, it is possible uh, that they can uh, get those services. If they're not on the pre-approved list, you just have to send an email out to your grant manager uh, and, and indicate what it is that is needed, how much it's gonna cost, who's gonna pay for it. And then your grant manager will uh, provide guidance related to that service that may be needed that is not included on the list. Um, Again, you can find information about wraparound services. There's a whole section in the grantee manual related to that. Um, if uh, there are other services that are needed that may be beyond our, um, our ability to pay for those, we encourage you uh, to then partner with, uh, with organizations in the community. Most of the services we are able to provide uh, but there may be some services that we may not be able to uh, provide, so we encourage you to uh, to partner with other organizations in the community. Keep in mind that if there is a service that is not pre-approved on our list of services and, uh, and you get approval from us to deliver that service, depending how your budget looks like, you may have to go through a budget modification. We already have discussed in the past what a budget modification entails, so we have to be careful about it. But I'm just uh, flagging it here that it's possible that if it's something that may not be covered in your budget, you may need to, even though we give you approval to do it, you may need to go through a, a budget modification to, to deal with it. There are a couple of tools that we have provided in the grantee manual that will be useful for you. Table 12, uh, it's, a, it's a very useful table on how to deal with uh, uh, 12 and 13 on how to deal with overcoming their barriers and providing wraparound services to participants. Do we have any questions in the chat? Norman, there was one chat in the, uh, one question in the chat from Maxine. She asked if they chose to uh, opt into a wraparound service after filling out the assessment, should they update the actual assessment that gets uploaded or just added to a person's uh, profile, which I did answer in the chat, but I'd like to hear your answer. <laughs> yeah, no, certainly. Thank you. Uh, no, if they already completed the assessment and then they, they need to opt into another service uh, while they're in the program, you can just add it to their profile under the wraparound services goal 
And again, we will train you. I provide more instruction on how to do that in IWRS, but no, no, no new assessment is required if they opt into another service. Thank you, Norman, for clarifying. I did not give Maxine the correct answer. So thank you to both you and Steve Scott for providing the correct answer. I appreciate it. No problem. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Let's talk about the wraparound services plan. Uh, there's also exhibit 15. Uh, grantees can provide wraparound services internally or through con contractors, partners, or through their referral network. Illinois Works developed Exhibit 15, which is the wraparound service plan to ensure that grantees have coverage for all the previously named services. This tool lists each uh, wraparound service and designates if this will be provided by the grantee or an alternative organization. Grantees should complete this with the name of the alternative organization so that staff are aware who to connect or refer participants to when they opt in, into a service. Uh, please keep in mind that this is a required document. You'll be required to submit it as part of the onboarding process. Um, so we will um, uh, work with you as we continue the onboarding to ensure that this is done. Again, tables 12 and 13 are available as tools that you can use uh, to address wraparound services. Uh, let's quickly do a Mentimeter activity. What partnerships have you established to help provide wraparound services. Have you so far already developed partnerships to help you provide wraparound services? And as we said, this is a required part of Illinois Works and is one of the key strategic components that are part of this program. So if you could please make sure that you're logged on to Mentimeter uh, and answer that question, I would appreciate it. What partnerships have you established to help provide wraparound services? Do we have any responses uh, in the in the in Mentimeter? Um, Gia, if you don't, yeah, here we go. Thank you. Any responses uh, to this question? Food banks, that's good, definitely. Food banks are great partners to be able to provide wraparound services. Um, places that provide clothing, mental health supports. Yes, that is great. Uh, given our modern times, mental health support is very important. Legal aid, also great. Employers, um, certainly employers are, are particularly good for transition services. Uh, other CBOs, yes, there may be other community-based organizations that specialize in providing services that your organization may not provide. So th those are great places. Um, Drug treatment, yes, yeah, certainly, uh, that's important. Um, financial ed partners, yes, that's also very important. Uh, housing, yes, any partners that you may have that can help provide housing, uh, important to continue to develop those partnerships. GED providers, yes, that's important. Uh, not so much for wraparound services, but for individuals interested in joining the program and they don't have a high school diploma or GED, those are good for um, um, referring them out so that they can get that credential. Uh, so thank you very much for participating. We appreciate all your answers here. Moving on now to the next section here of this uh, of this module, and with this we'll close, and then we'll take a a um, a little break. Performance based stipends is very very important. This is a requirement paying out a stipend. To uh, participants, it's a legal requirement that we have with the Illinois Works Jobs Program Act. In addition to providing wraparound services, programs are required by the Illinois Works Jobs Program Act to provide a stipend to all participants for instructional hours. Let me just make that very clear. Stipends are only paid for hours. You cannot pay stipends for transition services. You cannot pay stipends for student for wraparound services or 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 other services just for instructional hours. Stipends are a payment made to a trainee or a pre-apprentice program participant for living expenses and are designed to ensure that participants can maintain financial solvency throughout the tenure of the program. Uh, we have a copy of the Illinois Works stipend policy in the appendix of the grantee manual. I highly recommend 
that you closely read that policy. And if you have any questions, you ask them. It's important to remember that stipends are not a wage and program participants are not employees. This is a vital point that I cannot overemphasize. We cannot, whenever you promote your program, you can certainly mention stipends, but you cannot promote stipends with wage terminology because stipends are not a wage. Uh, Pre-apprentices are not employees. If we do not successfully use the right terminology, it may trigger an IRS audit of your program and it may trigger an IRS audit of all of our programs. So we cannot, we need to make sure that stipend terminology is used and it's only paid for instructional hours. All grantees must comply with the Illinois Wars performance-based stipend policy. Uh, the other th thing to emphasize here is that stipends are performance-based in our system. You cannot pay stipends that are not performance-based. Our policy clearly stipulates that only performance-based stipends are paid. Uh, performance is based on their attendance and based on their academic performance, uh, and they should be paid as the, as, as the participants progress through your program. One key thing I want to mention to you, and you should know this from the very beginning, that the lack of stipend payments inadequately following the sti stipend policy or participants complaining related to your stipends will most likely trigger a field monitoring visit by Illinois Work staff and or an audit by our DCO Office of Accountability. That is how sensitive this issue is with an Illinois Works and DCEO. Any issues related to stipends not being followed or paid accordingly can, can trigger a field monitoring visit or an audit of your program. So here are some of the key items related to the stipend policy that we that we use. Um, grantees must provide stipends up to Yeah, I, I lost uh, Norman's audio. Do you have it? No, I do not have it either. Dan, can you send him um, a note in the chat in the our internal team's chat? Sure. Mm -hmm. And if you would like, Anna could can finish this section, or you can't either. Now be an okay time to ask a few. There's a couple of questions in the chat. Yeah, thank you, Monica. We we do have you know you and Steve on who could address those, but it looks like it looks like Norman is rejoining now. Okay, there we go. Thank you all. For so Norman, Monica, I can go see ahead. You. Can you ask the question? Oh, certainly. Um, Gail wanted to know, are we allowed to pay, are they allowed to pay stipends monthly? Yeah, I believe that's the uh, part of the guidance that's in the grantee manual, the frequency and uh, monthly stipends are an acceptable uh, uh, payment term. Okay, and I'm sure Norma was probably getting to this next uh, question, but if a student missed training, uh, miss the training session, do we provide payment for their makeup sessions? Again, that, that will be based on the policy um, and it, it, there is language that allows that to, um, to happen. So, uh, you know, please review the grantee manual uh, section for that. And it, it, it's important that however it is established, um, you, know, you you need to have that in a written policy that's been communicated to your uh, participants, program participants up front. So whether you're paying every two weeks the stipend or uh, every um, month, however you're choosing to do that, or you know what the policy is for makeup sessions, all that needs to be. Uh, you and you can use our our template, and it all needs to be clearly identified up front. 
what your program policy will be. Um, can you hear me? I just want to make sure that everybody can hear me. Yeah, yeah we, can, we can now hear. Okay, great. Um, the other thing that's important about the policy stipend amounts must be the same for all instructional activities. Again, um, no stipends uh, uh, can be paid for wraparound services, student support services, or transition services, or during follow up. Uh, however, uh, we can definitely um, we can definitely uh, uh, here um, uh, pay uh, stipends for all other activities. Can you still hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you much. Because I, for some reason, I, I got a message that they couldn't hear me. Um, the other thing that's important is that stipends can only be paid to participants. You cannot pay stipends to individuals that are a lead. You cannot pay stipends to individuals that are graduates. You can only pay stipends to individuals that are participants while they are uh, taking training with the program. And final key point related to the policy stipends must be reduced if participants do not meet or exceed at the performance measures. Uh, it is important to remind you that uh, participants are required to attend 80% or higher of the hours uh, for each module if they're supposed to score 70% or higher and module post assessments and tests that they take at the end of the module, not meeting these thresholds should result in a percentage based reduction in stipends. That is the reason why it's called a performance based policy. So it's, it's very important that your policy uh, follows that. Each grantee is expected to use the Illinois Works stipend policy or develop one of their own. If grantees opt to develop their own stipend policy, it must meet or exceed the Illinois Works policy. Keep in mind, if you choose to, sell, to implement an alternative policy, it must be submitted to Illinois Works for pre-approval. We also have uh, two or three different tools in the grantee manual that are gonna be important for you to use in the appendix. Template 12, sample Illinois Works performance-based stipend policy, and also template 13, sample Illinois Works performance-based stipend procedures. Are there any other questions related to stipends before we stop for a little 10 minute break here? Hi, Norman, uh, this is Dan. Uh, when your audio had disconnected, uh, we had addressed a question and I'd like to clarify it because I did give uh, incorrect information. The stipend policy in the grantee manual does indicate that uh, stipends should be paid weekly or biweekly. So th there was a question regarding the, the frequency of stipend payments. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, ideally, uh, weekly or biweekly, bi -weekly, most programs right now pay stipends on a biweekly basis. Uh, paying stipends on a monthly basis is complicated because obviously grant uh, enrollees have to wait a whole month to be able to get money they may need to pay for certain needs they may have. So we definitely expect for those stipends to be paid on a weekly or biweekly basis, as again, as I said earlier, most grantees pay them on a biweekly basis. Uh, any other questions related to stipends before we break for a 10 minute uh, break here? There are no additional questions in the chat. Okay, great. So we're gonna take a 10 minute break. It's 1139 right now. We'll be back at uh, 1150 uh, when we come back. Um, Dan will continue on uh, with the next module. Thank you very much for joining us. And we'll be back again in 10 minutes.
All right. Well, welcome back, everyone. I hope you had an opportunity to stand up and stretch a little bit. Uh, I know we've covered a lot of content. Uh, we still have uh, several more sections of the uh, grantee manual to go. So we are uh, running a little bit behind schedule, but I'll do my best to uh, move us along while still covering all the relevant content. So we're going to be talking about uh, section six of the grantee manual. We're staying in section six. Not, this time we're going to uh, focus on student support services. So this section of the grantee manual uh, provides, uh, you know, a discussion on uh, student support services, tracking participant attendance, academic performance, responding to student alerts in IWRS, developing po policies for makeup of post assessments or missed sessions, complying with the uh, ADA requirements, and integrating DIBE and, again, the six core values into all of the elements of the uh, program's services. So uh, we are going to, um, you know, as I mentioned, stay in Section 6 and move forward with student support services. Student support services are those that support and address academic needs. Unlike wraparound services, uh, some of these supports are mandatory for participants based on challenges related to the academics, the attendance, or the performance. Um, and again, I, I want to stress, student support services are academic, that's why student is in the name, and wraparound uh, services are supporting the non-academic needs. So while participants may opt into some services such as tutoring, maybe for math or reading or digital literacy or other specific instruction, some services such as makeup hours for missed courses or retaking assessments may be mandatory uh, to complete the program. So student support services can be provided, um, are, will be mandatory when that participant does not meet the required attendance or the post-assessment threshold, and that will be uh, done in order to ensure that they are able to successfully complete the program. The requirements to successfully complete are 80% attendance or higher per module. Now, there are certain, um, certain modules such as OSHA 10 that require 100% attendance. Um, but overall, again, we're talking about on a per module basis, uh, 80% attendance. It's not overall for the program. That's very important to understand. Then also 70% or higher scores on post assessments per module. So those are the two uh, qualifiers that, that we're going to be looking at and that will determine whether or not uh, student support services are mandatory. If students drop below those attendance or performance thresholds, they're required to make up the hours or retake the post assessments. And you must have these requirements outlined very clearly with your participants. They'll be in the commitment agreement as well. Student support services can also be voluntary, as I mentioned, if the participants request additional academic support, such as maybe taking more time for tests, um, requesting environmental changes, maybe they need a quieter place to take uh, some of their exams, other way in, ways in which you're supporting their academic needs. If any of these support services are needed either due to, um, you know, the, the mandatory requirements that we just discussed or voluntary requests, the student support service coordinator must add these services to the participant's IWRS profile. Again, this will be discussed in more detail uh, later and in the IWRS webinar sessions in the uh, coming weeks. It's the expectation of Illinois Works that all the training modules have a corresponding attendance roster completed by the participants and signed by the instructor for every training. The Illinois Works 2024 Grantee Manual provides template 21 uh, as an attendance roster in the appendix. Rosters must be uploaded into IWRS after each training module or as a cohort as they're scanned in for completion. We'll review attendance entry in IWRS during IWRS uh, sessions. The Post-assessment scores, 
as part of participant evaluation, uh, all modules must feature a post assessment at the end of each module to ensure that the participants have successfully met their learning objectives. Each post assessment score must have a score, uh, a post, each post assessment must, must have a score of zero to 100%. With the exception of orientation, post assessments cannot be pass fail. So with orientation, that post assessment score will be 100% based on the individual providing the required documents, signing the commitment agreement, um, filling out the, the um, orientation career assessment and the wraparound service assessment. So participant scores must be immediately recorded into IWRS in order to track student progress and alert academic support staff of subpar performance. If a participant scores less than 80% on a post assessment, IWRS will add a red flag to the participant's profile, helping you easily identify that. As noted a moment ago, orientation does not require a post assessment to be administered um, uh, you know, uh, itself. Instead, it's the training module that will be uh, pass or fail. So identifying and removing the red flag. Student support service coordinators are responsible for identifying the need for and coordinating and ensuring the successful delivery of student support services. This staff member has access or members have access to robust IWRS dashboard um, reports and flags that will allow them to identify participants that need assistance. These alerts are meant to signal that participants are ready or required to receive assistance. If the participant red flags are related to academic needs, such as excessive absences, missing or failing post assessments or struggling with key lessons, the student support services coordinator should add the necessary support services to the IWRS profile so that they can, the participant can regain good standing in the program. Uh, these services should outline dates for makeup sessions or post assessment retakes, referrals for tutoring services, or provide longer time periods for the students to take post assessments. And once delivered, they should be marked as successfully complete in IWRS. It's important that you have a policy regarding your makeup, post assessments, and sessions. So there are two samples available in the appendix, uh, template 14, sample extenuating circumstances policy for makeups, and template 15, uh, the sample makeup session uh, and post assessment policy. So in addition to matching the participant with necessary academic supports, student support service coordinators should partner with the wraparound service coordinator to address any barriers that are preventing the participant from successfully engaging in the program. So certainly the cause of a uh, missed uh, class period or uh, poor attendance could be something that the wraparound service coordinator could assist in resolving such as uh, child care or family member care. So it's important to coordinate those actions together. So all support services are required to be tracked in IWRS on each participant's profile. Wraparound services will be automatically added to the participant's profile based on their responses in the wraparound service assessment. And during that assessment, they opt into the ser services the system will then populate those services directly into what we call the wraparound service goal. Student support services are not automatically entered. They will need to be manually entered based on need. They're often triggered uh, by circumstances such as, you know, a, a, a failed post assessment or missing a day of class. So as a result, uh, unlike wraparound services, they need to be manually entered into the participant profile, what we call the student support services goal. So on the screen is an image of the IWRS system and you can see the four goals there. Um, and it shows how wraparound services and student support services are displayed in the system. Certainly we'll cover these in more depth during the IWRS web webinar sessions. The American with Disabilities Act, or ADA, prohibits discrimination against people with disabilities. 
Illinois Works programs are ethically and legally responsible for adhering to the administrative requirements according to the ADA. So in order to ensure that, your program must have an, uh, a designated ADA coordinator, uh, provide public notice for any actions, have an established grievance policy, conduct self-evaluations of adherence to the ADA, and develop a transition plan regarding accessibility. Are there any questions regarding uh, this section? Anything that uh, was uh, uh, placed into the chat or if you'd like to unmute any questions you have at this time. Ben, there is one question in the chat from Henry and Henry, you may unmute if you need to provide additional details, but he asked what about practicum post assessment scores? And that was at the time that we were talking about the 70% or higher score for post assessments. So, um, you have the ability to enter more than one uh, post assessment per module. So if you have, say, a, um, a component of your uh, training that has, uh, you know, instruction, uh, both a paper assessment and a hands-on assessment, and, and the hands-on assessment is, is done through an instructor, um, you know, gr grading sheet, you could enter both of those assessment scores, and both of those would need to be above 70%. Okay, thank you so, so much. Would that be pass or fail with, uh, for, for the practicums? Because you see, you did mention for the orientation that would be on a pass or fail basis. The other ones uh, would be actual uh, percentage scores, but the practicums, uh, will that be considered pass or fail as well? No, that would not be considered pass or fail. Okay, so we have to actually give them a percentage score. If your curriculum requires uh, a, a, a post-assessment on the practicum use, then you would utilize that post-assessment score. Okay, thanks so much. You're welcome. Okay. Then there are a couple of questions here from Tina. She asked if the instructors aren't putting in the assessment scores, how is this done immediately? Is the expectation that our data person will be at every class? Um, and then maybe uh, the second part of that question is, is the instructor in entering this information at the end of each class? So that's a really good question. And each program is going to um, have a, a different uh, data management policy. But what we mean by immediately is that, um, you know, the, the entry of this data is critical uh, to be critically entered into the system as quickly as possible. So there are some organizations that are able to receive that attendance information or uh, post assessment information from the instructors uh, every day and the data entry coordinator then that, that afternoon or that morning the next day will enter that information in. Sometimes it's done at the end of the week. The important thing to know though is that uh, in our experience, the grantees that wind up with the most difficulty are the ones that were not entering data consistently, right? So this, this has to be something where you've developed a consistent process and there also has to be part of that data quality management, a mechanism for um, a, a, an additional person to then review and check that information. So by immediately, we don't mean that it has to happen live in the classroom but it can't be something where it has um, entered after several weeks or certainly at the end of the cohort. So uh, we're going to move on to the next section. Um, at this point, I'm going to hand it off to Gia uh, to discuss a little bit more about training and instruction. Okay, hey, thank you, Dan. And thank you everyone for, your, for sticking with us and for your attention and participation. So for section seven, we are going to talk about training, instruction, and certification. So let's take a quick look at our objectives for this section. We're going to, by the end of this section, you will be able to explain training expectations within the scope of the Illinois Works Apprenticeship Program, deliver an effective program orientation, 
utilize required tools, including the career assessment and the commitment agreement, comply with the Illinois Works for Apprenticeship Program curriculum requirements, Consider additional certifications or training modules that might be relevant for your particular target audience. Apply the Illinois Essential Employability Skills Framework to your program's soft skills instructional hours. Utilize best practices to evaluate a training curriculum. So we will talk a little bit about evaluation in this section and integrate DIBE and the six core values, which we talked about during section um, one in the previous training and core values into the all of the elements of your training instruction. Now, I know that looks like a lot given our time frame, um, but I have about 30 minutes to do this. So this is not going to take us an hour. Uh, this should only take maybe 30 minutes or less. So I am challenging myself here. So again, if you are referencing or if you've been following along in the grantee manual, we are now in section seven of the manual. And going back to our pre-apprentice uh, participants life cycle, we have covered today outreach and recruitment, application, intake. Dan just talked about wraparound services and student support services. And so we're now going to talk about training. And as you can see, we are almost at the end of our life cycle. So grantees, you were chosen because you successfully demonstrated your ability to provide pre-apprenticeship training and to prepare program participants for employment in the construction industry. Program instruction is the central tool used to implement the Illinois Works Pre-Apprenticeship Program. During instruction is when you will train participants, prepare participants, and empower participants within construction or the building trades. So here's the question, why training? And I, this is a, I appreciate this slide because I think it's relevant to differentiate between training and teaching. What we do is actually training. Training is a process that aims to increase the knowledge, develop skills, impact attitude, and or influence the behaviors in individuals to accomplish a specific job task or goal. And that the job task or goal is what's most relevant here. Training focuses on business needs and is driven by time critical business skills and knowledge. So the goal of training is to impact performance improvement, is to impact uh, participant and performance. So we wanna distinguish this from actually teaching. Teaching focuses on the information dissemination, knowledge acquisition and learning. So teaching really focuses on, um, it's more of an intrinsic process. How do we make people smarter? Training, focuses on business needs. How do we build skills in order to respond to the emerging business needs that we know organizations or companies will need? And that's what we do. We are responding to either current or what we anticipate as being future business needs and making sure our participants are trained with those skills so that they can be available for employment to respond to those needs. The distinction can be summarized as, you know, Training, I mean, teaching is theory, education, information, where training is skill building, performance, and practical application. So with Illinois Works, we do training, but very specifically, we focus on experiential training. Experiential training is also known as development by doing. So that's back to that practical application component. There are several approaches and modalities that leverage experiential training. We're not going to go into detail now. We are going to offer a subsequent session that takes a deeper dive into these topics. But right now, we just wanna make sure at a high level, you understand the general expectations. But some of those experiential training modalities include work-based learning, small group lab work, on-the-job training or practicums. So when we look here, we have construction laboratory training. This is when uh, the, um, the actual 
practice occurs in a facility that is a controlled um, environment, so you can control the conditions. The upside of being able to control the conditions is that you can implement a really comprehensive process. They can practice, you can give them feedback, and then give them an opportunity to practice again to make sure they're able to apply that feedback and perform the skill. The other opportunity for experiential learning that Illinois Works um, acknowledges is the job site. So a job site is actually a physical work location where construction is taking place. The advantage of a job site is that participants can actually see um, and actually experience the work culture uh, for construction or the building trades. However, different from the construction laboratory, you may not be able to stop get feedback and then have them repeat the task and then um, you assess whether or not they were able to accomplish the goal. So the job site, while they can experience the construction um, and building culture, it's not a controlled environment. So let's talk about staying in scope. We have an Illinois Works has increased the number, the number of minimum required hours for the curriculum in the program. So last year, actually, it was only 150 hours. This year, the minimum expectation is 177 hours and should not exceed 300 hours. So it is critically important that programs stay in scope. The overarching focus of the Illinois Works Career Apprenticeship Program is to fund programs that target underrepresented populations and that can successfully transition participants into a DOL registered apprenticeship program in construction or the building trades. The Illinois Works Career Apprenticeship Fund should be used within the scope of this particular goal. Career apprenticeship curriculum must um, have the 177 hours of instruction, but should not exceed 300 hours of instruction unless approved by uh, Illinois Works. So let me explain why we have that exception. There are some of you who are working with what would be considered higher risk populations or higher risk target populations. And even though you may provide the minimum um, instruction for them to be successful, they may have other needs. They may have soft skill training needs. For example, let's say you target women. If you target women, you may want to add an additional training on how to be successful in an environment that has not historically been welcoming to women. That instruction may be important for their success. So if you are augmenting your content to make sure you are responding to the needs of your participants, and you think that you may exceed the 300 hours maximum, you can actually get an exception. And that process starts with contacting your grant manager uh, around that process. Now, we'll talk about modifications later because when you change your curriculum hours, that has a ripple effect. But we do want you to know that although 300 is the maximum, there is a process if you think your participants need additional support in order to be successful. So let's talk about the required instruction. Illinois Works requires, and so Dan just talked about this. They requ Illinois Works requires four hours of orientation. Um, you don't have to use the four hours, uh, but we will pay a stipend for up to four hours. However, the first day of instruction should be the orientation. We'll talk more about that second in a second. You also have to have a construction curriculum Illinois Works has three construction curriculums that are pre-approved. We have Trade Future, MC3, which is formerly NAP2, NCCER Core, ICCB. Those are the approved construction curriculums. If you would like to use a different curriculum, it's possible, but it has to be approved. And again, for approval, that process starts with contacting your grant manager. However, if you're using Trades Future NCCER or ICCB, you don't need to go through that formal approval process. Those are already approved. We also have OSHA 10, First Aid, CPR. Okay. So those are the required certificates. In addition to that, I just talked a little bit about soft skill training. So soft skills based on the Illinois Works Employability Skills Framework is between 32 and 40 hours. And sometimes when we're exceeding those 300 hours, this is where that additional instruction will typically um, fall. 
test taking skills for hour, four hours. This is new construction math, 40 hours. And then work based learning or job site learning anywhere between 10 which is the minimum requirement um, not to exceed 50. But again, um, if you are thinking that might be necessary, that's a conversation with your grant manager. So that, that's all of the instruction that is considered in scope. In scope instruction, you can pay the, or you can, well, be careful when I'm using words around like um, employment, but Participants can earn their stipend for the in-scope um, instruction. Instruction that is required for Illinois Works, but is considered out of scope. So these are things that you may be doing that you are required to do for your participants, but they wouldn't necessarily get a stipend for it and it's not considered a part of instruction. It's considered a part of, these are um, often support services, but wraparound services, student support services, transition services, follow-up activities. These are all activities, but not considered a part of your curriculum. Other questions that we typically get around in scope and out of scope. For example, um, we often will get asked, what about GE courses? Is that in scope or out of scope? If someone does not have a GED or high school equivalency, of course uh, we want them to get that because they can't graduate from the program without it. However, that's out of scope. And so that isn't something they would receive a stipend for. Same thing, um, ACT preparations or college fairs absolutely support that you may want to provide, but wouldn't be considered part of the curriculum, thus out of scope, and participants would not receive a stipend for those. Any questions about in scope or out of scope curriculum? Monica, any questions in the chat? There are no questions in the chat. Great, thank you. All right, let's keep going. All right, let's talk about orientation. Orientation is a requirement for your pre-apprenticeship program. So I think Dan gave a really great example on the importance and value of that first interaction with participants when he referenced back to our in-person orientation, which created an opportunity for connection, building rapport, networking. What you want to do is also create an environment for your participants to have that type of connecting um, rapport building experience, which is why um, Illinois Works makes the orientation component required and is willing to give participants um, four hours towards their stipend for the orientation. Orientation should happen on the first day of your program. So again, orientation is a requirement for all participants and should be facilitated on the first day of instruction. The goal of the Illinois Works pre apprenticeship Program orientation is to welcome participants, communicate expectations and requirements, and to acclimate them to your program and your program culture. Orientation is also when, orientation is also when seven critical um, enrollment activities have to take place. So for example, during your orientation, participants should complete the wraparound service assessments, the um, orientation career assessments, and sort of start by this if you're taking notes, the uh, commitment agreement. It is important that programs develop an orientation agenda. Please don't lean your orientation. Um, prepare an agenda. And just as a heads up, we do have a sample agenda available for you that you can either use or repurpose. It's in the appendix template number 16. Um, so that's just uh, a tool that you could use to help prepare for your orientation. Um, but we highly encourage you to, to develop an orientation agenda that allocates enough time to, to cover all of the required topics. The agenda should be communicated to participants in advance of the actual um, event. You want to create interest. You want to set expectations that attending the program is required. Is required. Orientation to be should be facilitated by team members. So we highly encourage um, your program administrators, 
all of the coordinators, so you all know all the coordinator roles, student support service coordinator, transition service coordinators, um, all of the coordinators should be there at least for a portion to introduce themselves. Uh, shake the participants' hands and say hello. If the instructors can be there, you want the instructors to be there also because what you are doing is not just um, setting expectations but creating rapport. And uh, I don't want to take a deep dive in rapport, but I can tell you, if you want to increase your retention, it's by participants having a sense of belonging. And how do you create a sense of belonging? That is rapport building. Okay, I want to pause there so I don't take a deeper dive. Also, as noted in our previous discussion um, of post-assessment requirements, and this goes back to uh, the question that was asked around the pass or fail, orientation is considered a training service, meaning stipends can be paid for this hour, uh, th for these hours, again, up to four hours. As orientation is considered a training service, a requirement, it's part of your curriculum, Grantees will need to provide a post-assessment score in IWRS. So it sounds a little tricky because they don't have to do an actual post-assessment around who they met and <laughs> their orientation. This module is the only module, so the gentleman who asked the question about pass-fail, this module is the only module that you can enter a pass-fail score. Okay, orientation is the only one that can have a pass fail. So participants, so how do you grade them then? What's the criteria? Participants can receive 100% as long as they complete their wraparound service assessment, their orientation career assessment, and sorry again, their commitment agreement. They complete all of those. They are entered into IWRS. They earn 100% as pass for their orientation. Any questions about that before I keep going? You can either unmute or put it in the chat. Okay, I'll keep going. All right, so let's talk about the orientation career assessment, because this is one of those tools that um, is required for passing <laughs> orientation. So the orientation career assessment, during orientation, each participant must complete an orientation career assessment. This career assessment tool captures key information regarding the participant's career readiness, their primary and secondary career goal, and their anticipated timeline for transitioning to a career in construction once they graduate from your program. So during orientation, this assessment should be completed by each participant as in a group setting using a hard copy version of the assessment. So this is, so when you are planning your orientation, consider the space. You do not want to use that theater seating. This actually, this first version of the career assessment should be hard copy, pen and paper, and they consider desktops, consider tabletops, so they can all manually complete this at one time. So setting a time frame aside and having the whole group complete this at one time. And then later you can have uh, one of the coordinators enter this into IWRS. If you'd like to see a copy of this, we do have a copy available in your grantee manual. So if you go to the appendix, it is exhibit number five. So based on the participant's stated goal in the career assessment, Academic support staff and instructors must work together to develop a personalized action plan in order to tailor to the specific needs of your participants. So, for example, if you learn that one of your participants wants to be a, a pipe fitter, and let's say you part of your program is really proactive with mentorship and networking, if you don't have a mentor that's a pipe fitter currently connected to your program, well, the career assessment will alert you of that so that your team can start working on accessing those resources and making them available to your participants before the end of their program. So understanding what the needs are on the front end, day one, helps you best prepare for them as they matriculate through your program. So based on the participant goals, of course, you want to make sure that you are responding to their needs by partnering each of the coordinators working together to make sure you have the appropriate resources. The orientation career assessment must be entered into IWRS within 24 hours of completion, which is often the goal for um, 
often the goal for IWRS. Can you also see my, see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay, awesome. I just got to <laughs> double check. All right. All right, you keep going here. Now we can yeah, I thought it was coming. That's that little delay. Okay, it should pop back up in about three seconds. Can you see it now? In the meantime, I wonder if maybe we can answer it, it hasn't come up yet, but maybe we can answer Mimi's question. Is there a comprehensive list of construction jobs and or roles that applicants can choose from? And one second, really quick, Dan, can you give me sharing rights again? Or just take it away. Okay, please. Yes, the question. Can you repeat that question again, Anna? Yeah. yeah. Is there a comprehensive list of construction jobs slash roles that applicants can choose from? Oh, that is a good question. Yeah. I'm going to turn that over to the grantee. Um, the grant managers, I know that we don't have a comprehensive list. That is part of the expectation of the transition coordinator role, that, that, that the transition coordinator is actually cultivating relationships, partnerships, establishing MOUs, so that as the, um, and really using that uh, career assessment just talked about to identify what their participants will need, so that as they get to the end of your program, those resources are available. But I do want to pause and ask if one of the other grant managers want to add, or Norman want to add to that um, answer. So I'll share uh, some quick information, and in, in that, and that is, uh, Norman did mention the heat map today, and that's where you can see a fairly comprehensive list of the registered apprenticeship programs that your uh, graduates will be able to move into. And that's really the goal, right? So it's not just placing an individual in a construction job because certainly there are non-registered uh, or non-apprentices that can perform, uh, you know, carpentry work or uh, labor work, but it's, it's really moving them into that trade that makes the difference. Uh, so making sure that they're in a USDOL registered apprenticeship program. In addition, the, uh, the US Department of Labor uh, has a, an apprenticeship website that allows you to uh, explore some of that information as well. But so our heat map is one of the tools that we give you to use. Yeah, that's awesome. Thanks, Dan. Does anybody else have anything they would like to ask before we move on? Okay. So let's, uh, a few more points around the career assessment. Um, so the career assessment tool should be completed or will be completed twice. Uh, it won't be called career assessment both times. <laughs> the first time when they take it during orientation, it's called the career assessment. When they take it again, which is towards the end of your program, it's called the pre-transition career assessment. And the reason why we have them take it twice is the first time is so that your team can prepare to meet their needs while they're in the program. But the second time is that as they are in your program, they are learning, they are growing, they are developing, they are being introduced to new ideas, they are on construction sites, they are seeing work happen, they are having different experiences, and as a byproduct of that, their career goals within the construction and building trades may evolve. And the second career assessment allows you to check in with them to ensure that they are still interested in doing what they initially said they wanted to do. And if they do have a change of heart or they've changed their mind, you can capture that information and then start working with your coordinating team to respond to that need. The next tool I want to talk about is the commitment agreement. Again, if you're taking notes, this is the one that deserves, they're all important, this is the one that deserves a star. So the pre-apprenticeship training program commitment agreement is a written agreement between the participants and your program that clarifies the participants' rights, obligations, and the pre-apprenticeship program training conditions. 
the commitment agreement must be signed by one of your staff members, appropriate qualified staff members, and the participant, and then uploaded into IWRS for each participant in the cohort. In addition to outlining basic items about the program, such as dates, times, locations of the program, this agreement outlines the expectations of the program, such as attendance and post assessment requirements, which of course is connected to the stipend. Additionally, this agreement serves as the Family Education Rights and Privacy Act waiver, or the FERPA waiver. This is a federal law that affords participants who are 18 years or older or who have entered a secondary post institution at any age, which makes them an eligible student, the right to have some control over the disclosure of their personal information. So this law is the reason why a parent can write a check to a college for their child. And the parent, even after they've written that check, they can't call and ask the math teacher what grade they got in that course because their the right to their information is protected. And so in our case, no one can call and say, um, you know, what is you know, what what grade that they earn in their construction math, right? Okay, you want to see the screen click off again for a quick second, and I'm just gonna just gonna reshare again. All right. So here's the thing about that FERPA waiver: without a signed commitment agreement that includes the FERPA waiver, which is in the commitment agreement, your program will not be able to track participant data in IWRS. We just got through talking about those post assessments, pass fail, entering that data into IWRS. If they haven't signed this, you can't do that, okay? You can only share their educational information and their grades with us if this is signed. So Illinois Works will not be able to report their data you will not be able to share their data. If you want to see a copy of the um, commitment agreement, we do have a copy available for you. It's exhibit number six in your appendix. An unwillingness of the participants to sign this commitment agreement or share their information with Illinois Works will automatically disqualify them, disqualify them from the program. Because if you can't put it in IWRS, it will not, you, you can't be reimbursed for it. If it's not in IWRS, it did not happen. And if they don't sign the agreement, you can't put it in. If you can't put it in, you cannot receive uh, reimbursement. Any questions about the commitment agreement? Okay. So I wanna talk about additional certifications and considerations for your, um, for your um, curriculum. So we just talked about all of the content that was required, which that typically makes up that 177 hours. But you may decide that there's additional information or additional certifications you want to provide for your participants. Some of those include, and this is typically what we see or what we've seen in the past with um, pre-apprenticeship programs. Sometimes they will offer the flagrant certification, um, They'll want to enhance their soft skill or employability skill training. Again, this is tailored to your target audience. The individuals that you have recruited, that you are targeting, what do they need to be successful once they graduate from your program and are employed somewhere on site or in a DOL registered apprenticeship program? You also may decide that you want to do some training, and this is an expectation, but you may decide you want to do additional training on diversity, inclusion, belonging, and equity. Um, anything that may impact those things to help them be success, successful in your program. So you can augment your curriculum, again, getting to that 300, and here are some ways that um, oftentimes grantees will do that. All right, we're getting there. Curriculum approval. Your program must submit your pre-apprenticeship curriculum for approval prior to you implementing the program. The Illinois Works a curriculum approval process has two steps. One, you submit, and there's a copy of, and you 
seeing this because you've likely submitted already. It's Exhibit 10. Um, it's called the Final Curriculum Form. So you have completed and submitted the form to Illinois Works. And then the second step of the process is that your, the grant manager, once the curriculum is approved, you know that it's approved because one, they will email it to you, but a copy of the approved version of the curriculum will be uploaded to IWRS. The final curriculum form is generated by the Illinois Work Pre Apprenticeship Program based on the curriculum submitted to Illinois Works during the grant application process. The form will be sent to the program administrator and it's used to confirm training services. So those are the service hours, um, the service titles, the hours per module, and confirmation that a student evaluation is going to be um, uh, disseminated to participants for that module. Upon approval, your grant manager will upload it into IWRS. After adding training services to um, your uh, provider page, so if you look at your provider page, you'll see the approved version of your curriculum. Um, then that approved curriculum will be auto-populated once your participants enroll in the program. So your curriculum will auto-populate for each of the participants. I want to spend a few moments talking about the evaluation process. We've already had a few questions about it. And when we have the subsequent session, when we take a deep dive around instruction and training, we actually spend more time talking about the Kirkpatrick model and how to create um, post-assessment or evaluation tools that correlate with the objectives of each of your training modules. But I will not, we will not take that deep dive now. Let me just give you a high level snapshot of expectations here. So the Illinois Works Pre-Apprenticeship Program 2024 Grantee Manual, there are additional sec sections and training modules, um, instructional planning and training evaluation. So if you go to, again, this section in the Grantee Manual, you can also read about some of that content. But here's what, what's the information you need to know right now. Instructional evaluations are required, and again, we only do pass fail for orientation. Everything else requires a score. Illinois Works utilizes the, utilizes the Kirkpatrick model for training evaluation, and there are four levels. We have level one, and this is important to know, so make note. Level one is highly recommended. It's not required, it's highly recommended. Level two is required. Level three is not applicable. And level four, we will do, but it is a longitudinal study. And we're working with, um, there's a team of, team of NIU uh, researchers who are going to support that. So level one is the smiley face. It's typically what we do at the end of our programs. Did you like it? How was the space? Did it meet your needs? Did you learn something, right? That's the one that's recommended. Level two is whether or not they increase in knowledge. Sometimes organizations will do a pre and a post test so they can measure the increase in knowledge as a result of the instruction. The post test, um, you can do a pre and post or you can just do a post with the minimum score. That's required. Level three is about behavior, um, behavior, attitude, we don't measure that here. And again, level four is more about return on investment. So we're talking long-term, given the amount of investment that the state of Illinois is making in this program, we wanna know long-term, are we getting a return on the amount of money that's been invested in this program? Table 17 in your grantee manual will actually give you some context around what's available and where you, need to, where you may need to create um, evaluations. So um, it says NAP2, but this is really um, Trace Future NC3, NCCER, and ICCB. Those do have some built-in evaluations, either level one or level two. Same for OSHA 10, first aid and CPR. They either have a level one and a level two, or they have a level two. The rest of the content, your team will need to create that post-assessment or evaluation tool. And these are some of the examples here that you need to be thinking about because they are a required part of your curriculum. Okay. Worksite personal protective equipment. We added this content new to the grantee manual. And I'm just going to be very honest because we have been on site with participants um, just doing site monitoring. 
and we've seen participants on site, on construction sites, without proper PPE. And so we want to be explicit about this. Okay. As grantees, as your grant, as um, as grantees are in their final steps of instruction preparation, it is essential that you are considering the safety of the participants. As stated earlier in the section, it is required that participants spend time at construction sites or construction laboratories and on active work sites to fulfill their experiential learning um, requirements. But to ensure that everyone is safe, there must be PPE and they must be wearing it. So whoever the on-site program um, supervisor is, so the person from your organization that's there, you are accountable for ensuring this. So I am not going to get, go, you know, explain all the PPE that's necessary, but I want you to know that information, detailed information is available for you in this section in your grantee manual. But some of the things you should be thinking about, head protection, eye face protection, hearing protection, respiratory protection, foot protection, and back support. Okay. One more thing I wanna talk about before I hand this over to my colleague. As noted, once the final curriculum form is finalized, I uh, once right, the Illinois Works Career Apprenticeship Program grant manager will enter the approved training courses into IWRS. When a participant is enrolled, all of these courses will auto-populate on that participant's profile and will be available for you to submit attendance, post-assessment scores, update their uh, certificates, and any other relevant credentials. Tracking training services and IWRS is outlined more in Section 7 of your grantee manual. Um, but again, if you have not registered yet for IWRS 1, IWRS 2, IWRS Training 3, and IWRS Training 4, we have four sessions that will be available to you to train you and your staff on how to do all of this Illinois Works Reporting System tasks. So if you have not registered for those, you and your team, anyone who will be entering data, please be sure to do that because we will take a deeper dive in what happens once the curriculum is uploaded, um, the content that's auto-populated for your participants, and then the content that you will be required to update and enter. All right. Any questions about training, curriculum, or instruction? There are no questions Monica, are in the chat. I'm, I'm sorry, there are no Great. questions in the chat. All right, thank you, Monica. All right, I want to hand this over now to my colleague, and I am racking my brain to remember. Dan, are you up next? Or is Norman taking this last module? I'm doing the last module, Julia. Great, so I am handing this over to Norman. Norman, they're all yours. Thank you very much, Julia. I appreciate covering all uh, information and guidance related to instruction and curricula. Um, this is the last module in this webinar. I apologize, we're running a little late. I'll try to cover this as quickly as I can, but we do need to make sure that we do justice to this part of the webinar as we're covering the last few steps of the uh, pre apprentice life cycle. Um, so the objectives for this section is reference program completion definitions, complete the required pre-transition reassessment, describe transition staff responsibilities, articulate expected outcomes and deliverables, provide transition and follow-up services, identify active follow-up versus long-term follow-up, and communicate to transition partners and participants about the Illinois Works Bid Credit Program. Uh, integrate DIBE and the six core values into all elements of your program's transition services and follow up activities. As I mentioned, we are focusing on section eight of the grantee manual, which is called Program Completion Transition Services and Follow Up. I recommend that you read that in the grantee manual. Uh, program completion, transition services, and follow-up. All stages of the pre-apprentice life cycle are essential to participants' success. However, program completion, transition services, and follow-up are the stages of your program that allows you to start measuring your impact. This is really where the rubber meets the road when it comes to Illinois Works. 
And I want to emphasize something that I have an opportunity to discuss with a lot of grantees as we engage in various activities. Uh, Illinois Works is not just a training program. Uh, there is a tendency in the workforce world to do a good job in recruiting and a good job in training. But then when it comes to transitioning, that's where the programs start to experience uh, difficulties. That is not Illinois Works. We actually have a model that flips the workforce system upside down, meaning your most important service is your transitioning services uh, because if you have graduates and by the hundreds or the thousands, but they cannot successfully transition, we would not achieve the main goal of Illinois Works, which is to transition graduates to do a career in construction in the trades, particularly into DOL registered apprenticeship programs. That is our legal mandate, and that's the reason why we exist. As a result, our model emphasizes significantly the role of transitioning uh, individuals, you know, making sure that they complete and transition uh, into construction and the trades. Program, program uh, completion refers to the conclusion of instructional training and the beginning of transition services. For most participants, program completion will mark the end of their instruction or training at the beginning of their transition to a registered apprenticeship program. As I mentioned, that is the primary goal of Illinois Works as stated in the Illinois Works Jobs Program Act, which is the law that regulates Illinois Works. What are the different statuses at the end of the program that a particular individual can be in? Uh, first of all, it could be successful com completion, right? Ideally, most of our uh, enrollees end up in that status. They successfully completed uh, in IWRS, uh, complete is either complete or complete in a transition. This occurs when the participant has met all program requirements. Some may refer to this as the program graduation. This marks participants' completion of classroom, construction lab, workforce training, worksite training, and recognizes their attained hired certifications. This is very, very important because legally, we cannot give a status of completer unless they have met all of these requirements. They are they legally have certain um, certain privileges, and particularly the contractors that hire our graduates have certain privileges in the state of Illinois if they're hiring completers. So as a result, we have to be very careful about what we who we consider a completer and a graduate. Some grantees uh, throughout the year host celebration ceremonies, you know, graduation ceremonies. Uh, when they hand out uh, certificates of completion. If you do, even though that is not a requirement, you do decide to do that, uh, please, uh, um, uh, we would request that you invite us to those events as we want to be able to meet our graduates and also uh, their loved ones as they celebrate their graduate success. I, I particularly enjoy going to these events throughout the state just to make sure that we stay connected with the populations that we serve. Uh, something new this year is that the Office of Illinois Works will issue official certificates and graduate cards uh, to verified completers. Uh, once you receive those certificates and cards, please keep them on file, keep copies on file, and make sure that your graduates receive the, uh, the original documents. Graduates must carry those graduate cards and present them to their employers when asked if they are Illinois Works graduates and what their graduate ID number is. This is very important for contractor compliance with Illinois Works, uh, with the Illinois Works apprenticeship requirements and for claiming Illinois Works bid credits for hiring and retaining Illinois Works graduates. So that card, that ID card will have the name of the graduate, will have the date they graduated, will have uh, their graduate ID number, and that's what they will present to employers if employers request that information in order for employers to comply with Illinois Works. The other status that could be assigned to, to a participant is unsuccessful completion, which in Illinois Works is incomplete. Some participants may present, uh, may be present throughout the program but are, are unable to graduate because they uh, may be needing additional services and tasks. Maybe they have to do some makeup exams or makeup sessions, among others. They probably did not satisfy what graduation requirements, particularly attendance, 
and academic performance. The student support services coordinator must create an action plan for successful completion for each participant. Um, something that is key with individuals that were there to the end, but did not successfully complete is to not disengage from those individuals. If you disengage from them, you are not likely to be able to successfully re-engage them. In my experience in running a lot of programming on the ground, if you successfully stay engaged with them, create an action plan on how they can uh, fix any issues they had, you can typically uh, graduate the majority of those individuals. Sometimes those individuals may have to return to a future cohort to finish some, some uh, training that they did not take a module that they didn't take, or sometimes it's just about making up hours or making up tests, uh, but it's important to remain engaged with them. The other status uh, that could possibly that a participant could have is withdrawal, and IWRS is incomplete. Some participants may choose to withdraw from the program. Before a participant withdraws, withdrawal is finalized, the student support service coordinator should meet with a participant one-on-one -on -one to determine if there are any wraparound services or student support services that can be offered to keep the participant from withdrawing. In some circumstances, additional support may help the participant change their decision to withdraw. However, that is not always the case and grantees should seek to maintain a positive relationship with the participant regardless of the participant's final decision. Sometimes participants completely change their mind about what they wanna do, even though they uh, were committed to the program and construction, now they wanna be a nurse, or now they wanna go to the military, or they move out of state and they have to withdraw. If they still choose to withdraw, conduct an exit interview. An exit interview is required when someone withdraws using the exit interview questionnaire. This is an opportunity to gain an evaluation of the program overall, key components and seek participant feedback as the participant and follow-up contacts will be welcome. There may be a future opportunity to re-engage them. There are times when life gets in the way and something happens, uh, um, you know, someone gets sick, they got sick and they need to uh, withdraw, but uh, stay in contact with them if they are interested so that you can um, uh, see if you can re-engage them in the future. Uh, exhibit one, number one is the exit interview questionnaire. Uh, that should be completed manually and saved in the participant's file. A hard copy of the questionnaire is available in the appendix of this manual uh, or in the resource section of the Illinois Wars Partner Guide. So once again, that is a tool that is being provided as part of the grantee manual. The next uh, status that a, a uh, enrollee can have, a participant can, ha can have is dismissal. And in IWRS, dismissal is also incomplete. This course, this occurs when participants fail to comply with the terms of their commitment agreement or violate program policies. You must mis maintain a dismissal policy that outlines a standard procedure of how, when, and why participants can be dismissed. Once a participant is dismissed, all services from the Illinois Works uh, Peer Apprenticeship Program must be terminated through the IWRS. A copy of the dismissal letter must be saved in the participant's file and uploaded into IWRS. Again, program completion refers to the conclusion of instructional training and the beginning of transition services. If you are dismissing someone, let's make sure that is being done in a structured way following a policy because this may cause legal difficulties in the future or challenges when it comes to auditing and why a particular individual was dismissed. If someone has, if you have a good basis for dismissing the person, as long as you're following the policy, you can certainly proceed to do that. Uh, <clears throat> any individual, when it comes to compliance with Illinois Works, any participant who is considered uh, an unsuccessful uh, completion, withdrawal, or dismissal uh, are viewed as incomplete and are referred as incomplete in IWRS. Um, and that will definitely affect uh, your reimbursement given that Illinois Works is a performance based model. Any questions about that before I move on to the participant satisfaction survey? Okay, uh, Monica, any questions in the chat? No, I don't see any questions. Okay, let's talk about the participant satisfaction survey. Um, 
In keeping with Illinois Works' focus on continuous program improvement, both a grantee and a net, at the network level, all pre apprenticeship participants will remain engaged in the program through the end of instruction, if they, even if they do not successfully complete, will be asked to provide feedback on their program experience through a participant satisfaction survey. This survey is a requirement and grantees need to ensure all of their participants take it. Um, this information you can find on section eight, page 146 of the grantee manual. The participant satisfaction survey was developed by Illinois Works in partnership with the Center for Governmental Studies at Northern Illinois University and will be an integral part of the program evaluation process. One of the key components of our longitudinal evaluation, GIA referenced uh, earlier today, is uh, the fact that we need to collect feedback from participants to get their perspective. Um, Transition services, moving on now to transition services. Transition services are a series of career readiness activities that serve as the final step for participants before progressing to a registered apprenticeship program and employment. Here's one key thing about transition services is the transition staff. Transition services are led primarily by the transition service coordinator or TSC. The TSC is accountable for transition and follow-up services for all graduates of the program. While most transition services will be provided at the end of each participant cohort, the TSC should be building relation, building or strengthening transition relationships throughout the program year. In fact, the TSC must start engaging participants starting in the program's orientation day. So the best and most successful Illinois Works programs are the ones that invest enough resources in a dedicated transition staff member in a model that starts developing transition relationships with enrollees from the very beginning from uh, the orientation and ensuring that they uh, build on those relationships throughout the program and then stay engaged with them once they graduate. That is the most successful models that we have by doing that you'll ensure that all your graduates receive transition services, but most importantly, that they actually transition to DOL registered apprenticeship programs and employment, which is the primary goal of Illinois Works. So this person, the transition service coordinator, and I really encourage you to spend enough resources hiring a qualified individual uh, to deliver these services. This person is responsible for developing relationships with DOL register apprenticeship programs with unions, with contractors, and other employment partners. Also, is responsible for scheduling face-to-face -face meetings with participants to identify career goals using the pre-transition career assessment, assisting with or providing transitional services to participants, including apprenticeship application fees, resume writing, interview preparation, among others, conducting follow-up with alumni, adding and maintaining graduate profiles in the applicant tracking system. We'll talk about the applicant tracking system in a minute. Participating in the Illinois Works Transition Activity Program, which includes monthly reporting and meetings designed to build transition service network and enhance transition services. More information about the TSC staff is available on page 154 of the grantee manual. I really encourage you to design a strategy in and stay focused on ensuring that transition services are a top priority for your program. If you enroll the right audience, train them and graduate them, we are not going to have the impact that we need to have in construction unless we're able to successfully transition those individuals. Transition process. The transition services coordinator provides transition services guided by a transition plan developed in partnership with participants and based on the information collected from the orientation career assessment. Um, you know, what's really important here is um, if we are able to properly deliver these services, you will have a, an action plan, which we call a transition plan to work with. Your, your transition service coordinator will have the information they need so that they know where these enrollees want to go. Some of them may want to be electricians. Some of them may want to be plumbers. Some of them may want to be carpenters. 
through that plan, you'll be able to identify when the plumbers open so that they can apply, when the, you know, the electricians open so they can apply. What are the requirements if you want to be an electrician, what are, which are different than if you want to be a carpenter. So that information is very important and that plan will give you the ability to collect that information and then create an action plan on how to proceed. The first step for this final phase in the transition process is to conduct a pre-transition career assessment. This finalizes the participants transition plans, which includes facilitating job readiness sessions, resume writing, and interview preparation among others. It outlines the traits of interest and, particip and participants' job readiness needs. The plan is created in IWRS. This plan also assists transition staff as they help participate move from pre-apprentice trainees to full apprentices. Keep in mind that the needs, the career goals, and the needs of each of your graduates is different. So this pre-transition career assessment in their transition plan is the one that guides their needs, just the same way that the uh, uh, wraparound needs assessment uh, was the one that guided uh, the wraparound services you provided. This plan guides what transition services and career needs your graduates have. So let's let's go a little bit deeper into the pre-transition career assessment. Three to four weeks prior to the end of training, the pre-transition career assessment must be completed. And again, uh, Gia addressed this a little bit before, but why is it that we do two uh, career assessments, one during orientation and one uh, before, just before they finish their program? The reason is because a lot of participants change their mind about what they want to do. Uh, sometimes, you know. Uh, they really thought they wanted to be an electrician, and now they find out through the program that they're more interested in being a commercial painter or they're more interested in being a plumber. And as a result, our career assessment needs to be able to capture those changes. But at the same time, it may be that once they went through the program, they decided that no, now what they really want to do is be a chef instead of being in the construction industry. And that's fine if that's what they want to do, but we need to capture that so that we know how to support their transition out of the program. The transition service coordinator is expected to meet one-on-one -on -one with each participant to complete the career assessment. This career assessment will mirror the one they completed during orientation, but unlike the original assessment, which was, which was used to guide training experiences, the goal of this assessment is to help staff build a transition plan. This assessment will be completed directly in the I, in IWRS in the intake and referral screen during the one-on-one -on -one meeting with a participant. On your screen is an image of the career assessment. At the top of the assessment, uh, grantees will designate if this is an orientation or a pre-transition career assessment. Based on the current discussion, this image is set up as the pre-transition career assessment, but the orientation career assessment will have identical questions. Again. There is no difference between one and the other, except that one is done during orientation uh, and the other one is done right before they finish their program. Moving on to transition services themselves. Transition services should be added to the participant profiles in IWRS. It may include, but is not limited to alumni networking, mentorship, apprenticeship application fees, providing career information, res resume building and writing, interview preparation, assistance with completing an apprenticeship program application, job application assistance, job search assistance, starting a small business or a business, community college application, American Job Center referrals. Depending on what their career goals are and what you find out through that assessment, you may have to create different paths for different graduates that may involve all of, all of these or some of these services that I just listed. It is the expectation that all participants who, who successfully complete the program will be provided with one or more transition services that will be documented in IWRS. More information about these services, guiding questions, and allowable costs are available on page 148, section 8 of the grantee manual. And I want to emphasize that all your graduates, regardless, need to receive at least one or more transition services. We cannot have graduates that exit our program without receiving the transition services that they need. As a result, you need to have dedicated staff and the resources to ensure these services 
are successfully provided and reported in IWRS. And as I mentioned earlier, you'll be receiving extensive training in IWRS to know how to document that in IWRS. Any questions or any questions in the chat, Monica? There are no questions in the chat, Norman. Okay, we're almost done with this, just a little bit more. So bear with us. Uh, going into Mentimeter now, what partnerships have you established to help support transition services? If you don't mind answering the question on the screen, what partnerships have you established to help support transition services? What partnerships have you established to help support your transition services? Uh, someone mentioned resume writing. That's one of the um, transition services we offer, but who provides that? Do you do that yourself? Are there any partners that you're engaging with? Local unions, yes, that's fundamental. Local unions are the ones that run most of the DOL registered apprenticeship programs. We want to transition our graduates to very important to have relationships with them. Interview practice sessions, interview practice sessions are um, definitely activities that are required and requested under transition services. Uh, job fairs, yes, partner with organizations. Uh, sometimes, you know, IDS offices or um, job centers um, offer job fairs, uh, definitely partner with them. Uh, chambers of Commerce sometimes uh, sponsor job fairs, uh, partner with them. Those are very important. Local colleges, computer lab, that's good. I mean, local colleges certainly are a good place where you can, you can partner with them. They offer a variety of services uh, that your participants can tap. Construction companies, the, this is fundamental. You know, ultimately, Illinois Works is not about training. It's about transitioning graduates to employment and the all registered apprenticeship programs, having relationships, long term relationships, uh, active relationships with contractors, with construction companies is fundamental for your success. Local businesses, business leaders to help facilitate practice interviews. That's great. Yes, certainly uh, you should partner with them. Uh, they can also be uh, good sources for mentors for your uh, participants, uh, particularly individuals that went through pre-apprenticeship programs or that went through an apprenticeship program and are journey, um, journey persons out there. Uh, definitely encourage you to partner with them. So moving on now, thank you for participating. We appreciate, appreciate it. Uh, one thing, one tool that we have mentioned earlier and I want to spend a little bit more time here talking about is the applicant tracking system. In, in the 2024 grantee manual session one, we briefly discussed the applicant tracking system in relation to the Illinois Works bid credit program. As a reminder, this system captures participant information and provides it in a database that can be accessed by contractors. Grantees are required to enter uh, Illinois Works verified completed participants into, into the ATS or those that uh, Illinois Works holds to be completed based on an approved appeal. Once the pre-apprentices have successfully completed the program, grantees are required to add them to the ATS as part of the participants' transition plan, along with keeping that information current for each of their graduates. It's very important that you engage in the applicant tracking system. You will receive separate training and information related to the applicant tracking system, and this, this gets done once you finish your cohort and you have graduates, but the applicant tracking system is used by contractors uh, to request graduates in particular areas of the state uh, to fill job opportunities they may have. It's also used by our uh, career services team to do job matching for those contractors. Uh, so it's important that your uh, graduates are entered there and the, their information is kept updated in the applicant tracking system. Uh, the Illinois Works Bid Credit Program, we just mentioned that earlier. Uh, the Illinois Works Bid Credit Program is the third key program of the Illinois Works model. This program provides incentives to contractors to hire and retain Illinois Works pre-apprenticeship program 
graduates while they complete their DOL registered apprenticeship program. The bid credit program is a unique benefit provided only to Illinois Works pre-apprenticeship program graduates, making them more competitive in the labor market. Grantees can discuss the bid credit program with transition partners, especially contractors, as a benefit their graduates can bring to their companies. Uh, to be bid credit eligible, a participant must successfully complete the Illinois Works pre-apprenticeship program. What that means is that uh, they, um, all the pre-apprenticeship program approved and required certificates must be earned. The participants must have a, must have attended 80% or more of all modules and earned 70% or more on all module post assessments. Successful completion must be verified by the Illinois Works. Again, graduates of your program carry very important uh, benefits for the contractors that hire them. As a result, we need to make sure uh, that uh, those contractors are aware that they can earn bid credits for hiring our uh, graduates, and then they can use those bid credits to successfully bid on state funded projects in the future to make their bids a lot more competitive. Uh, upon successful completion of the Illinois Works pre apprenticeship uh, participants will receive again a certificate and a car uh, that they can provide their potential employer as evidence of their bid credit eligibility. Um, information on how grantees can communicate about the Illinois Works Bid Credit Program to transition partners and participants is available in the 2024 Grantee Manual on page 152. Okay, uh, moving on now to the last uh, few uh, items here that we need to touch on before uh, we close this uh, webinar. Uh, what are the expected outcomes and deliverables of Illinois Works? Transition staff have a significant influence on helping programs achieve the primary uh, outcome of this program. By the end of the contract period, your program is expected to meet the following deliverables in, uh, as stipulated in your grantee agreement. At least 85% of enrolled participants must successfully complete the program, which includes them securing their certification. At least 75% of enrollees must transition to a DOL registered apprenticeship program. All outcome measures are based on your program's contract and specific participant metrics. Once participants transition to a DOL registered apprenticeship program, and in some cases, a secondary transition goal, the transitions coordinator will also be responsible for conducting participant follow up. Let's move on to the next section to discuss follow up. So you have already completed the individual successfully. You have provided transition services to them. Now the last step in the uh, in the pre-apprentice life cycle kicks in, which is follow up. The final step of the pre-apprentice life life cycle is follow up, and programs are required to conduct follow up activities for one year after a participant exits your program. This is very important. This is a contractually uh, contractual mandate. Once a graduate exits your program, you need to do follow up with them for a year. This step provides you with the opportunity to build a robust alumni network and to maintain a connection with the participants and more importantly, to collect outcome and employment data. Additionally, the Illinois Works Network can begin to build data driven best practices based on long term data collection. So it's important to stay in touch with them. Um, and to conduct that follow-up uh, so that you know uh, what they're doing out there and any needs they may have. So how do we conduct this follow-up? Program follow-up is an essential part of the Illinois Works Pre-Apprenticeship Program. There are many ways to regularly stay in touch with program graduates. You can do surveys, focus groups, phone calls, text messages, social media, post, email, uh, visits. They can come and visit. It's important, obviously, to do to stay in touch with them so that when you do your active follow-up, uh, they can respond to you. Active follow-up denotes a contact between the transition services coordinator and program alumni on a quarterly basis for one year following program completion. So, you know, you are uh, required to conduct quarterly follow-ups, active follow-ups with those individuals that graduated, your transition service coordinator, needs to do that. A follow-up is a contact between 
transition staff and program alumni on a quarterly basis for one year. The follow up questions are guided by whether an alum is pursuing a registered apprenticeship program or not. The first year is when apprentices may be most vulnerable to dropping out of an apprenticeship program. During each follow up contact, the transition service coordinator must complete a follow up questionnaire, which is available electronically in IWRS. So when when the transition service coordinator is doing these quarterly follow ups, they will they will use the questionnaire, uh, which is again available in IWRS, uh, to conduct that follow up. Uh, please keep in mind that uh, beyond that first year, Illinois Works uses data matching in its career services team to track participants long term to follow up up to ten years after they exit the program. Again, the goal is for us to really find out what's going on with them uh, and to provide any supports we can after they graduate. Long term follow up uh, beyond the 1st year of active tracking, Illinois will, will utilize data matching to track employment and outcomes. Long term follow up is also when the Illinois Wars career services team becomes involved with graduates. The Illinois Wars Serv career services team is designed to help maintain connections with graduates for the purpose of helping with future transition and, and to collect long-term data. This data will be part of a longitudinal study that will track participants up to 10 years after leaving the Illinois West program to determine the effectiveness of pre-apprenticeship programs and the grantees impact on individuals, communities, and the economy. So part of the follow-up services that can and will be provided uh, uh, to these uh, to these graduates have two main uh, functions. Follow-up services are used for reporting and tracking program and participant data. Uh, that's that's important. Again, you could find that information uh, information related to the longitudinal study on section 12 of the grantee manual. Follow-up services and activities after apprenticeship and or employment placement facilitate further development and boost retention. So once the individuals also transition either into employment or DOL registered apprenticeship programs, staying in contact with them uh, may help uh, retain them. Um, and at the same time, uh, they may be in need of uh, other services. So let's summarize here some of the follow up services uh, that that can and should be provided. Referral to resources. So once that follow up is conducted and, and we find that they still have needs, they can be referred to services. Uh, we also track services in the apprenticeship program in or on the job. It's possible that they may be struggling in the apprenticeship program. They may want to uh, transfer to another program or on the job and they may need support finding another job. Apprenticeship and heart related peer support group and work related peer support group. Now, this is very important because a lot of them uh, we have underrepresented populations, women, minorities, and veterans that peer support groups may be very helpful in providing tips and strategies on how to succeed at the workplace or in DOL registered apprenticeship programs. Assistance with apprenticeship and work related problems. So if they're facing any issues out there, we can certainly intervene uh, if possible to be able to address those. Um, so those are some of the services that could be provided. Um, and again, it's an active tracking questionnaire that gets completed in order to collect all of that information. Are there any questions? With this, we finalize this webinar. Uh, are there any questions? We just have a few minutes evaluation that will be conducted by Anna Bedar. But before we, we move on to the final evaluation here, just wanna check to see if there are any questions uh, Monica or anybody else uh, interested in any questions related to transitioning? We do not have any questions in the chat, Norman. Okay, great. Thanks for joining us today. Please stay, stick around for a couple more minutes as Anna Bedar conducts the final evaluation of this webinar. Anna, please go ahead. Anna, we cannot hear you. Um, Gia, can you hear me? I, I cannot hear Anna. Can you hear me? Norman, I'm okay to move forward with the evaluation really quick. Okay, please go ahead. Okay, so if you are still logged in, 
please just answer a handful of questions for us. Um, of course, we want your feedback. If you are not logged into Mentimeter, please log back in. This will only take a second. Thank you so much. The first one is, please share your views on this training by reading the following statements, one being the lowest, 10 being the highest. To what extent did it meet your expectations? How likely are you to attend the next event? And how likely are you to recommend that other staff persons attend the training? I'll just acknowledge that I know this was a lot of information. Um, this is actually the heart of your program. So um, it's just important that we didn't, if it took a little longer that we did not skip the content that we wanted to make sure you had it. Any other responses for the first question? Thank you, this is very helpful. Okay, we're gonna to go to the next question. This course was relevant to what I wanted to learn about the subject matter. This question is relevant to what I wanted to learn about the subject matter. And just as a tie back, this is actually a Kirkpatrick level one evaluation. So so that you know um, contextually here. This is a level one evaluation. Any other respondents here? Thank you for your feedback. I see the response numbers increasing. We appreciate this. Awesome. I see more responses coming in. If you did not start with us in this evaluation, you can still log into Mentimeter and join the evaluation and give us feedback. I plan to apply what I learned. Okay, I see responses still coming in. What improvements might you recommend? Thank you, other responses? Awesome, yes, thank you for this. I know, it's intense. Mm -hmm. Right, thank you for this feedback, this is helpful. Absolutely, thank you. One of the things we have not entertained, but it might be worth it, instead of doing three grant management trainings, would it be better to just do four and break the information down a little more? So instead of three trainings, we would do four. Thank you for that. Okay. Thank you for that. We've, we've debated whether one more session you all would kill us or not. <laughs> um, but the four would allow us an additional time frame. Three is fine for me. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So I appreciate this comment. When we do the IWRS uh, sessions, we will not only do demo but there are certain parts of that content that you will be able to participate with us. So there, there is actually some both demonstration and hands-on. So we will be one more granular with the IWRS sessions, 
We will demonstrate how to do it in real time, and we will actually give you an opportunity to do some practice. So thank you for that. Okay, awesome. So if we make changes, and we frequently make changes, hearing from you was important and helpful to us. So if we make changes, is there anything you want us not to touch? Like if you change something, that's great, but don't change this thing. Thank you for that. Uh, mm -hmm. We can do that. Any other feedback? Very last question. Is there anything we have not asked about that you think we should know? We have not asked about it, but you think it's important for us to know. While you are responding to that last question, I will turn it back over to Dr. Ruano to close the session. So thanks again for joining us today. We know this has been a very long uh, webinar. It's very important that we cover some of the main aspects of the Illinois Works program. Uh, we encourage you to join us for the next webinar. Uh, register in the Illinois Works Partner Guide so that we can proceed to the last uh, uh, webinar that is covering the grantee manual. I hope you have a very good day. And again, thanks again for joining us. Bye bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you guys. Presentation.